Bonsoir à tous, euh, bienvenue à, à Super Public. Euh, juste un petit mot pour, pour vous expliquer, pour ceux qui découvrent le lieu où vous vous trouvez. D'abord, remercier le personnel Démocratie Forum d'avoir choisi Super Public pour faire cette, organiser cette soirée. Et puis Audrey Tang qui nous a fait le plaisir de passer la journée avec nous à, à Super Public. Quelques mots en français, puis je pense qu'après on va passer à... On va passer à l'anglais, ou en tout cas rapidement. Super Public, c'est un lieu qu'on qu est quelques-uns à avoir ouvert. Donc moi, je m'appelle Stéphane Vincent, je dirige une association qui s'appelle la 27e Région. Et on fait partie des acteurs qui ont ouvert ce lieu il y a un, un an et quelques maintenant. C'est un lieu qui s'appelle Super Public parce qu'il est consacré à l'innovation dans le secteur public, plus largement l'innovation politique, l'innovation démocratique. Et donc les gens qui travaillent dans ce lieu, pour certains en permanence et pour d'autres de façon plus éphémère, sont tous des passionnés de la transformation de l'action publique. Euh, et donc on organise ici euh, des conférences, des workshops, euh, des formations et puis euh, un certain nombre de, de structures qui travaillent ici. Et donc on est très 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 heureux de, de vous accueillir ce soir euh, et, euh, et d'accueillir euh, Audrey. Et donc Clémence, peut-être qui va nous dire euh, euh, l'objectif de cette, de cette soirée. Merci Stéphane. Je vais rester en français quand même pour l'instant. Euh, alors je m'appelle Clémence Penn, voici Mathieu Le Rondeau, le directeur associé de la Net Squad. Euh, on organise ensemble le Personal Democracy Forum France depuis à peu près 5 ans. C'est une conférence américaine qui est organisée à New York chaque année en juin depuis à peu près 10 ans. J'aime à dire que c'est la conférence des gens qui pensent encore qu'Internet et les technologies peuvent changer le monde. Euh, mais en fait, en 2016, j'ai le sentiment que euh, la civic tech est en train euh, de redevenir euh, vachement à la mode. Et à ce sujet, on vous donne rendez-vous du coup en juin, euh, le 10 juin, à la Gaîté Lyrique euh, pour euh, la conférence annuelle PDF France. Euh, et on va euh, lancer dès ce soir un call pour les pitch, allez-y, euh, pour, euh, pour la première fois faire euh, pitcher les startups de la Civic Tech. Et merci beaucoup à Super Public. <rire> merci. Euh, oui, ben, je suis Mathieu Rondo, donc directeur associé à la Net Squad qui euh, soutient, alimente euh, et contribue à organiser donc euh, Personnel Démocratie en ouverture donc euh, de, de Futur en scène tous les ans depuis bientôt euh, bientôt cinq ans. Uh, I say a few words in English, uh, so you can just uh, hook up. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, uh, Audrey yet. Audrey, who's pretty much, uh, uh, you'll forgive me for saying this, but uh, uh, who, who pretty much became a star uh, these days, like in, in, in Paris. For those of you uh, who haven't met her at La Nuit des Idées, uh, during, uh, that was on the 27th of uh, January uh, at the Ministère des Affaires étrangères. Uh, for those of you who wouldn't have seen the uh, uh, excellent documentary uh, by uh, Tous les Internet on Arte, Uh, or read uh, Claire Richard's paper uh, back at the end of September uh, uh, in Rue 89. Uh, I'll just give a few uh, very simple uh, introductory words. Um, at 12 years old, uh, Audrey uh, became a, a self-taught programmer, right? And uh, pretty much decided to leave school to, to, to code. Uh, created her first startup at uh, 15. Uh, and pretty much defines herself today uh, as a retired, uh, as retired. Um, that's a definitely a retired, a young retired person. Uh, uh, retired, but also uh, uh, as a different and uh, interesting uh, uh, other things that may uh, uh, say uh, uh, surprise us here. Uh, as a notably uh, a conservative anarchist, I've read this somewhere. I'd like you to maybe, if you have a chance, to define and to explain us uh, what, what you mean by that. Uh, but also is, and probably more importantly for us, uh, people from civic tech in France, and for all, uh, all of us uh, civic designers, uh, well, uh, uh, someone who creates tools uh, to reinvent democracy. Um, just to, to finish up and, 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 and start up with you talk, Uh, I, I, I also want to say a few words about uh, uh, GovZero, which is uh, this group of civic hackers you joined uh, in uh, Taiwan, and which was definitely played a, a very transformative role uh, uh, during the, uh, the, the, uh, the and, and defining the new 
politics uh, in, uh, in Taiwan, and especially during the uh, 2014 Sunfire Movement, uh, which gave rise to an entirely new breed, you could say, uh, of, uh, of, 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 civic, uh, of government and of open government uh, down there in Taiwan. So we're very honored to have you here uh, today and uh, that you give us this opportunity to have this, uh, this conversation. Um, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to spend, I think, more than two hours with you. Uh, I, I love this uh, super public place because it feels like I'm uh, speaking with you, not for you. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, I'm looking at the screen as everybody is. So uh, I, I like to uh, talk a little bit about the, the format uh, of tonight uh, because this is actually a uh, four different talks um, that talks about the GovZero and then about uh, the GovZero way of civic hacking and it also talks about the Sunflower Movement which is how we occupied uh, the Congress, the Parliament for 22 days and then we also talk about the so-called post-Sunflower politics uh, in Taiwan. So um, because I, I don't actually know which of those four or five different topics what everybody is interested in, I, I would propose that uh, I will go on with my slides uh, and then anybody could just raise your hand or don't raise your hand, just start to speak uh, and uh, um, in, in English or I'll try to understand French, but we have excellent interpreters here. And then uh, we, we can just use uh, the slide as material for, for discussion and I'll just doodle something uh, on the slides. And then if uh, people are generally looks, you know, bored or something, I'll just fast forward uh, that particular part of slides so, so we can talk about whatever uh, people feel like talk about. Uh, is that okay with you guys? Uh, okay, cool. Right, and then um, so um, the the uh, facilitator wants me to talk a little bit about the conservative anarchist. Uh, this is this is actually a very very um, mundane idea because um, I, I joined uh, the the internet in back in '92, uh, and at that time the political system that defines the internet, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, is done with a group where everybody can join. There's no credentials, there's no anything, and people don't have voting or kings or rulers. People just sit together or write on mailing lists and get a rough consensus of where internet is going. And this is um, mandatory for internet because if people uh, with my computer and your computer don't agree on the protocol where the computers talk together, there's no internet, right? So, so people have to arrive at some sort of consensus and you cannot really coerce anybody to do innovation. It's oxymoron. So the, the idea of internet is that people innovate however they like and that they try to convince their peers, their neighbors that this is a good idea and if they convince their neighbors, then they, their neighbors adopt the same protocol and then the internet upgrades with uh, different, uh, more useful kind of protocols like the World Web, right? So, uh, that, so that's how actually anarchy uh, is by definition, that's, that, that's anarchy. Uh, and, and that's how the early thinkers of anarchists uh, define it, it's just put into practice uh, around the 70s and 80s uh, on, on internet. So uh, conservative, conservative means uh, again, very uh, mundane definition is that there's a tradition that is uh, we think generally good and worth protecting. And as the world changes, uh, we try to adjust the tradition very slowly as to not break uh, what already worked before, but uh, have it adapt to the current world. That's what conservatism is. Right? So, so a conservative anarchist is then knowing that the anarchism model has worked since the 70s and uh, try to keep the same anarchist model that defines the internet and try to keep it working with different areas and endeavors of, of human history of human society. And so this is the kind of anarchism that I try to, to conserve. So as you can see, this is very everyday. <laughs> this is not, not radical. This is just uh, a way of living. Right? Okay. And central to the idea of the internet brand of anarchism is the idea of fork. Um, People who, who work in open source or, or coders or hackers uh, may recognize the, this word. But um, th this word means uh, basically on the internet it's free to duplicate 
somebody else's projects or somebody else's designs. Uh, and I, fr I mean free in two different ways, meaning that first there's no cost, very little cost. And then um, again, uh, when people relinquish their copyright, you don't also have to ask for permission. It's what we call forgiveness over permission. So if you see a website or a internet protocol works not entirely to your liking, you can fork it, meaning that you take the same program, you run it on your computer, and you change a few things so it works differently. And then that means not eliminating what has come before, but take it to a different direction. And if you also make public uh, of your modifications, as early internet hackers always do, uh, then the original people, what we call the upstream, the people who you get the fork from, uh, may decide to to take your contributions. So this is how you know science advances. So this is the same uh, as the, the internet lawmakers uh, make the earliest internet laws is by forking each other's uh, programs. Uh, and when I say law, I, I don't mean um, jurisdiction, I mean physical law, because uh, on the internet, uh, internet protocols, the laws that define what's possible and what's not possible, and that's what physical law is, right? So um, without further ado, this is a um, four or five different stories about how we apply this kind of anarchist uh, internet-oriented way, but uh, apply it to governments, which is, has not been uh, a domain where it has been applied before. So that was the uh, today's talks. And again, feel free to interrupt me, or uh, if I'm talking too fast or with too much jargon, uh, just uh, interrupt me and, and we'll have a discussion. So, I'm Audrey T, and uh, this slide, again, uh, under Creative Commons, is already on my uh, Twitter account, so people can download it and uh, join the discussion, perhaps, on Twitter. Uh, and uh, I just arrived two days ago to, to Paris, and I came from Taiwan, uh, which is seven hours in the future, uh, so I'm literally from the future. And <laughs> and um, I'm almost done with jet lag adjustment. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm very happy to, to be here and talk about uh, what I have been doing as the moderator has introduced since my retirement in, in 2013, which is two and a half years. Um, be before my retirement, I worked in the IT industry for 20 years. And uh, um, so it's not a early retirement, really. It's just I started rather early, and then uh, and I still do consulting work with with Apple. I've been working with the Siri team uh, on computational linguistics for the past five years, and then with uh, social text on Facebook for the enterprise, and then also work with the academics, the the dictionary people in the OUP, and the uh, uh, government sector people in the Taiwan National uh, Development Council. So, uh, but. Most importantly, uh, I work with them, not for them, by uh, working on projects that's on the third sector, which means the voluntary sector, meaning that people I, I work with, they, they choose to donate their time and effort and energy to, to work on the dictionary, which I'll talk about, and the Vita One uh, rulemaking platform, which I'll also talk about. And the result of those uh, two projects, because they're open source, we relinquish, abandon our copyright. So people in the first sector and the second sector usually just harvest uh, the, the outcomes and, and improve their, their own uh, service and products. And that, that's actually uh, the way I prefer uh, to work with them. And also, as introduced, uh, I learned programming when I was eight, and it was 89. Uh, and I got my first computer, I think, in June. And some other thing happened in June in, in Beijing uh, at that year. And my father actually visited Beijing uh, in his capacity as a journalist for the first time. And so he, he actually covered the, the protest uh, all the way until, I think, June the 1st. And then he flew back to Taiwan, fortunately. And then, uh, and then he, he went on the dispatch to Berlin also uh, later that year. And again, something happened that year. So um, the, the point here is that um, in, in Taiwan, um, we lifted off our martial law uh, that year. And then the first presidential election is six, seven years after that. So uh, the democratization is exactly the same uh, 
day as us uh, to the internet or to personal computers. So which means the digital natives, they are the first generation who could actually participate politically. And so this creates a entirely different dynamic uh, compared to what we see in the uh, older uh, democracies because the digital natives were um, variously thought as, you know, apathic to politics or not interested in mobilization or, or things like that. But in Taiwan, this is uh, completely the opposite. The, the first generation who got on the internet are also the first generation who could protest without getting arrested. Um, so that, that's the, the background. So um, I uh, lived in Germany for a year and a half. And because my dad's PhD at that time was uh, studying the dynamics of the Tiananmen uh, movement in Beijing, because a lot of people flew to uh, Paris and to, to uh, Germany. So uh, we did a lot of interviews and debates with them and uh, talk about how to do democratization um, in a way that doesn't end violently. So that's my childhood. Um, and uh, when I come back to Taiwan, to a um, de democratized Taiwan. Uh, I quit school because uh, in 94 the World Web was uh, invented and I, I discovered that I could work with the scholars and researchers uh, over the World Web and because they were also new to the World Web everybody was very enthusiastic uh, and so we work on a lot of projects and they don't have to know that I'm only 13 years old. Uh, so and then <laughs> for, for the next 20 years or so I worked on, on a lot of free software or open source projects. I think only the most geekiest of the audience will recognize all of the, the symbols. Uh, but um, I think at least the Wikipedia I think people know about. Um, but the the, those uh, projects have something in common. They they all create a space that's relatively safe, and then for people to experiment, to write, to share what they have, and it's okay to fail. It's okay to you know do mistakes, faux pas, whatever. And but uh, because it's a safe space and it's open source, people eventually learn from each other's uh, experience and mistakes, and then eventually uh, got into something very valuable for the humanity as a whole, like uh, Wikipedia. And then uh, this is the, um, my colleague, uh, Liu Jiahua, uh, who said that behind the technology, there must be a set of values um, informing its pursuit. And so personally, for my, my value was just to build a safe space for people to learn from each other and build something that's workable. So that's, that's about me. Um, the next part was about GovZero. In Taiwan, uh, in 2013, uh, early 2013, um, the usage of Facebook has um, reached, I think, 90 percent. Uh, 90 percent of people who are online are on Facebook, uh, and because of the internet use, is also uh, something like 85 percent. So it's a lot of people on Facebook. Everybody's on the Facebook. And um, there's a prediction that says within uh, the end of this decade, there will be more Taiwanese on Facebook than the population of Taiwan. Uh, because <laughs> some people have more than one Facebook accounts. And, and so this is a, a very um, highly networked uh, place. And so Naturally Wired uh, did a um, sort of report on this and then ask one of the leading political thinker, writer, um, and also heavy Facebook user, uh, Zhang Lachun, uh, of what, what's his take on Facebook. Does it improve civic engagement? And he's like, no, it just feels as if uh, we have participated. We could very easily get, you know, tens of thousands of likes. But if we mobilize people uh, to go to some place, then only maybe 10 people come. Because people were lazy, he says, on Facebook. Anything that requires more than a minute of their time, they won't do it. Uh, so, so he couldn't think of anything practical that only costs a few seconds, but that, that makes a civic impact. So if we um, have to describe Gov Zero with just one uh, short sentence, it's just we, uh, we are a movement that tries in every which way to create a way for lazy people to engage in real action. That's the, the Gov Zero motto. So, example. 
Um, this is a campaign we, we did, um, uh, I think, uh, a year and a half ago. We, we made a, a CAPTCHA. Uh, I assume everybody knows what a CAPTCHA is. This is a way to prove you're not a robot. Uh, it's not going to work after last year when robot soft is better than humans. But uh, for, for a time, uh, it could tell whether you're a robot or a human. And then uh, we made a CAPTCHA where uh, people would just type whatever here and just click enter. And um, I mean, this takes maybe five seconds of people's time. So it's good for lazy people. But this website that we built says that you're saving the country by participating in this CAPTCHA. And that is because those numbers came from the campaign finance records. Because the uh, Taiwanese campaign finance law, the Sunlight Law, uh, was designed in the era of Xerox printers. So it says, you know, one has to file all the campaign donations and where the, the campaign finance has been sent, but it's kept in paper form in this building that is the corrective building. And so everybody can go in and then do a Xerox copy with watermark to make sure that, you know, the tally is not wrong. But there's no digital download, you cannot download a spreadsheet, there's no um, transparency law because the law was made before the internet, uh, right? It, this makes sense, right? But after the internet, people keep proposing bills like, okay, now we should make it downloadable and digital and so on. But if there is one stakeholder that is going to be negatively impacted by this proposed change, it's the lawmakers. So, so it's always scheduled into the parliament. It's never voted on. And it's, it's been going on like that for years. So, um, so it, it's to the benefit to everybody except the lawmakers for, for some reason. So, um, so we decided to, to do it ourselves, meaning that we uh, bring people to the building and take the copies and, and we use a A4 paper because that's the only paper they have and print it on the 323 double-sided way. So every paper we can bring nine pages out and then we, we digitally scan it and then we ask people to digitize it into spreadsheets and so that we can do real analysis on it instead of just you know confirming that the corrective um, body is is doing their math correctly, which was the only thing we could do with papers. Now, if you try to digitize a page, uh, I try it. It takes maybe three minutes to five minutes in, in Excel, which is larger than the so-called John Dachin limit on, on Facebook. So if we call people to di help digitizing, nobody will come. Uh, uh, we know because we tried, and then but then we made it into a game. We used OpenCV, a computer vision uh, library, to split it into what we call Dofu, which is uh, bite-sized tasks. And now this one only takes five seconds. So then we made it into a game, and asked people to do. And uh, the key of doing this, if people have played, I don't know, Farmville or Candy Crush or uh, things like that on, on Facebook, you, you know that. If you put a countdown timer, if you put a progress bar, and if you put batch into it, people will do whatever. And then, and then people will spend the whole night digitizing uh, those, those single cells as long as it takes less than five minute, uh, five seconds and they get an instant reward. Thank you for saving your country. And, and things like that. So, so uh, then we made it into a game and saying that, you know, thousands of people are playing with you and, and, and things like that. And, and so, so yeah, it became a game. And so the first, batch of those, uh, and we have designers who design very pretty uh, campaigns. So the first batch that we brought out, which is more than 30,000 uh, uh, records, were digitized by 9,700 people within 24 hours. And then each cell has at least three people looking at it and two people agreeing. So, so we are reasonably sure that this is the okay uh, digitization of a campaign finance record and people feel like they're saving their country and they're spending less time than, you know, um, posting a cat picture on Facebook. So this is a win-win situation. So, uh, and, the, and the good thing was, yes. Uh, actually, no, they're all over the place. Yeah, uh, I think 90% uh, are over from Taiwan, but because it only requires you know, very rudimentary um, OCR processing. You can skip all the Chinese and only help digitizing the the numbers. Right. So, so international uh, participants are also among us. So, so it's it's crowdsourcing, but it's crowdsourcing in a very grassroots way. 
and there, there's no assignment, there's no, no task, there's no top-down authority, and everything is in the open. So when people uh, from the opposing party question this process, we say this is the open source scientific process, you can just download it on your computer and rerun everything to make sure that we, we're kosher, right? Uh, and the corrective UN, the, the auditing organ, then issue a press release saying that you cannot be 100% sure um, because there, there's bound to be errors maybe um, all the three people made the same mistake like, like how, how do you guarantee that this is 100% correct and then we said okay if you pass this legislation you can re uh, release data that's 100% correct and so this is a you know um, north wind and the sun kind of strategy uh, wh wh which kind of worked actually they're actually now uh, changing the rules as of this election cycle so uh, this changed the, the dynamic of the, the civic society with the government Government. This is not petitioning, not demonstrating. This is demonstrating in a different way. It's a demo, right? This is a, a demonstration of how it may work. And then if the government likes it, just takes it. So now that we have a complete record of campaign finance records, we can have you know the tables, we can uh, correlate it uh, with uh, their uh, stock portfolio, their declared um, donors, uh, the owners behind those donors, uh, and also the, there's a legislator voting guide which correlates all, all the council members in each city and each county, and their suggested um, construction budgets uh, and correlating it with their uh, campaign finance. So there's a, a lot of very interesting things that could be done with this sort of raw data when correlated with other data. And this actually really changed the voting behavior. Uh, the first version we, we posted has more than half a million people uh, visiting. And be because under every uh, precinct, there's a, a discussion board. So so people would just post uh, additional material, or, uh, and people would say, like, like there's 22 candidates in my uh, region, but after viewing this website, I only have to choose between two. So, so things like that uh, really worked pretty well, and we also see the uh, party finances and so on. But this is not only limited uh, to crowdsourcing politically. Uh, after getting help from the international community, we also give help to the international community. There was this Nepal earthquake. And uh, if you look at Google Maps or Apple Maps, the only street level maps are around Kathmandu and uh, the connecting uh, roads. The, the very uh, small roads, uh, like country roads, they were not mapped by streetcars because a lot of them, <laughs> streetcars don't even drive on them. So uh, so there's a, a lack of mapping uh, around that area. But then after the earthquake, uh, everybody needs the mapping because otherwise the, the UN and the Red Cross couldn't really um, send the supplies in it. So. Um, the OpenStreetMap team uh, worked with uh, GovZero and the uh, humanitarian teams in other countries. Uh, it's a very international effort to digitize in the same way. They divide the maps into very, very small uh, map uh, areas and then ask people if you're first time mapping, then it gives you a very small area. And then you just mark where is the road, is the road broken, is there buildings, is the building down. And then uh, using satellite image that's before the earthquake within 24 hours, uh, they have mapped everything and have the expert reviewing it. And then for the first time, um, the satellite company donated the imagery after the earthquake in the first day. And so for the next 24 hours, people concentrated on the post-quake um, satellite image. And so on the third day, when the supplies actually came, they now have a, a real map that uh, reflects which roads were broken, which uh, camps were set up after an earthquake, and so on. So it really helped the, the humanitarian relief uh, effort. Then again, we, we could do this in Taiwan. Uh, we don't have to fly all the way to, to Pal. And uh, I think Taiwan is maybe 10%, 12% uh, of the mappers because we did a lot of outreach and uh, instructions on how to how to map it. And our um, president-elect also um, helped a lot on promoting this uh, behavior. So um, this actually points out of the way that GovZero works is by uniting three kinds of people who don't actually work together much before F Zero in Taiwan or indeed anywhere in the world. Um, we, we started with the free software people uh, who don't usually care about public matters, right? And then, 
right? So, so, um, right? So, so these people don't really care about these. And then um, we we then introduce this idea of hands-on, uh, like just do it and, and fix things that you don't look like, which gains our uh, trust with the social activists who share the same same value. But then this doesn't scale. We have to also uh, get a message out to, to make it cool to, to participate to this kind of thing. So we need the civic media, the, the bloggers, the Wikimedians, the people like those. But then th those people um, share something with us because they, they trust strangers. Uh, the, the key of doing open source is that you, you trust random people on the internet to help you digitize things to uh, help you digitize maps and things like that. And this is what the, the civic media people are especially good at, and which the traditional social activists are especially bad at. So, I mean, th there is very interesting because uh, the three groups of people each lack something that the other two uh, groups of people could provide. And so just by um, organizing things in a way that lets people learn from each other, uh, we eventually converge into something like the digital um, campaign finance campaign, which was started by somebody in the civic media, a very famous blogger. But he, he has this very cynical way of writing about things because he feels the country is helpless, and hopeless, and things like that. And then we, we brought him to our hackathons and proved to him that if you just you know trust the strangers, we can get the internet do your job. So, so what is the hackathons? Uh, Gov Zero. Uh, has a hackathon every other month that's 100 to 600 people. It's a very large hackathon. And then every other month, there's a smaller one that's about 50 people, but still a lot of people. And then practically every weekend, there's a, a smaller one with maybe 5 to 10 people that's specific to a project. So our large hackathons, as it were, uh, are just ways for people to um, start new project. It's like an incubator project. We meet at this large venue, and when you join for the first time, or uh, for any time, there's a bunch of stickers on the table. This is maybe only half of it. And then you can choose whether you specialize in agriculture, music, uh, tax, jurisdiction, any kind of uh, programming language, and so on. And then people take those stickers and put it on the shoulder, at their shoulders. And if you're a first time here, you, you take this deer. And if you're a veteran here, you take this Taiwan bear. So, so what, what this is about? This is about um, playing musical chairs. On the beginning of the hackathon, everybody with an idea goes on stage and presents, sometimes with PowerPoint, uh, for three minutes. And they would say, I would like to make a public finance report website. I would need two coder, one designer, one storyteller for this task. Right? And then, so usually there's about 20 projects for each hackathon, many of them a new project that never people have never heard before. And now, then we play musical chairs. Um, so with stickers, one can see at one glance that this corner uh, in the open space already has their staffing of engineers. So engineers go to some other you know, groups. So, so people introduce themselves and then just join whatever uh, projects they find interesting that still has vacant slots. And usually a lot of first timers, those dear eyed people would just stay and don't know where to go, right? So and then the, the people with the bear uh, badge will walk to them and start walk very slowly and ask what's what's your hobby, what's what the things you care about and so on. And by the end of the walk they will find themselves in a project. So so this is a, a, a very interesting way for people to to discover each other's projects and then participate in it. And then people work for an entire day, sometimes two days, and by the end of the day Every project takes five minutes to present what I have done today. And usually they have a prototype. And then they will say, let's meet online at some Slack or chat room, or let's meet every Friday or something to, to make this uh, actually complete. So, um, and so this kind of incubation project means basically, even if I'm already involved in a lot of long-term projects, for one day every month, I forgot 
I forget everything about my existing projects and make myself available to the opportunity of new projects. And of the 20 projects every month, maybe 15 will not survive to the next month. Uh, maybe they will prove to not be a good idea. Maybe they will lack the, the necessary expertise. But because all the projects are required to be open source or creative commons, uh, all the failed projects become then materials for the next month's project, which builds on their basis. So, so that's that's how a lot of, you know, ideas, social enterprises, um, long-term project, crowdfunding projects uh, came about in, in this kind of open space. And because we don't have a, a agenda, it's an unconference, uh, you, you can meet people from all walks, walks of life. It used to be more than half were engineers or designers, but now we're less than 25%. Uh, the social activists, uh, lawyers, civil servants, uh, everybody. One of the code of conduct um, that we do in the hackathon uh, is called less is more, which means, <clears throat> and this is a, a very, uh, or worse is better, right? Uh, the worse is better uh, philosophy is especially needed in the East Asian context because people care a lot about face. Uh, people don't really want to throw out something that's ugly, that's incomplete, or that's um, shameful or something, I don't know. But uh, in, in GovZero, we started saying, you know, worse is better. You don't uh, think about your face. And we demonstrate this is the Zero's hackathon. Uh, and the logo of GovZero were designed by two brilliant hackers, top class coders, who absolutely sucks at design. Uh, I, I'm very sure that everybody here can design a better logo than this, because they literally only took five minutes or maybe five seconds to put this together. I think it was with a notepad or something. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a very ugly logo. And, um, um, and they had the guts to just print it out in A1, uh, large paper, and hang just like this in the Academia Sinica in the open space for everybody to see. And then the, the magical thing is a, a visual designer, even Wu, look at it and then tweet it, saying that looking at this ugly logo hanging here, if I don't work on improving it, I will lose my productivity for a day. Or maybe a week, I become so upset. <laughs> so, so it makes him furious, I guess. And says, so after a day of work, he came up with this, which is better, right? This is like uh, talking and chatting and voting. So it's a little bit better. But then, because he also relinquished the copyright, other designers could also improve on it. So then they de um, decided that this is good on laptops, but on phones, this is not really identifiable. The, the small dot is not visible. It's often mistaken for a Q, uh, GQV. So we had to register the GQV.Taiwan domain because people actually <laughs> got to the wrong domain. And then a, a better design eventually emerged. And then so we can just use the zero uh, in the graph zero uh, as our main uh, visual identity. But then without, you know, people just don't afraid of losing face and throughout this very ugly design and infuriate all the visual designers, uh, none of these developments would happen. And if not for the fact that we're all uh, relinquish our copyright, uh, this is not possible to build on each other's work. So this becomes kind of the, the rallying cry, the, the culture of Gov Zero. It's just whatever you, you have, even if just you know some handwriting or a mock-up, you don't have to know coding, you don't have to know design, just throw it out. And then people will get upset enough that they join your team and improve your work. So that's uh, about the Gov Zero's organization. Uh, before I go on, to other projects, there's is there anything people want to talk about? Comments, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Right, the subjects. <coughs> so <coughs> this is a, a very good question. The Gov Zero, I think the our primary innovation is our domain name. The domain name is Gov Zero. Taiwan, and all the government websites in Taiwan ends with gov.tw. Right? And then I think in French it's G-O-U-V, but it's the same idea. So for example, for the environmental agency, it's emv.gov.tw. Now on your browser, if you change the O to a zero, you get into the shadow government that is the Gov Zero version of the environmental agency. 
that, that shows exactly the same data as the environmental agency, but with much better visualization, open data, and, and so on. <laughs> it's a better version of the, the environmental agency. And then, uh, and the same like with the parliament. So the legislative organ of uh, Taiwan government, if we change the O to a zero, they get into this shadow cabinet, uh, shadow parliament that uh, shows exactly the same bills. It's like a progress bar, like a shopping cart, like where the bill is coming, who is signing the bill, who are the legislators, and cross-referencing to their campaign finance records and their voting records and things like that. So to answer your question, um, the uh, concerns, the topics of the subjects are as diverse as the third level domains of the Taiwan government, which is everything, right? <laughs> so there's agriculture, there's uh, education, there, well, you name it. And wh whenever people uh, are sure enough of their retake on the government, they could then register a domain that is the same as the government domain. And then we don't have to remember those domain names anymore because everybody knows how to reach Gov0. You just change the O to a zero. So, um, so I think that's the hack, the first hack, uh, the zeros hack that we did. And then um, it also says that we, we are completely inclusive because the, the government, by definition, concerns all the walks of Taiwan's life, right? So, or, or any people's life. So, people who care about that particular part of the government then uh, do innovation uh, around that function. So, that I, I hope that answers your question. Any other thoughts? Yes. Uh huh. Right. Um, so, I'm going to my next talk is the the one that I personally uh, involved in the educational shadow uh, dictionary, uh, and they react very slowly but uh, positively, uh, and which is the the next talk. But after the occupy, they react very swiftly and very strongly, and that's the the other uh, talk. But generally, it's a positive reaction. Sorry, there were another question. Uh, we use GitHub pages a lot. Uh, we use GitHub for our server hosting. So that for most of these pages, uh, even though it's half a million views, uh, <clears throat> we don't pay a dime. There's no cost in, in setting these kind of things up. So um, joining Gov0 for, for a lot of people is a way to, to learn about all the free spaces <laughs> on, on the internet because we, we had to use mostly uh, free of charge services because otherwise when you fork my project, you have to pay an additional cost, which excludes a lot of people out. So uh, by definition, we, we use only tools that cost nothing. Yes. Maybe a short comment about uh, sure. uh, trying to compare uh, our local context. Uh, here in France, we have a lot, here in Paris especially, but, uh, but all, all across France, we have a lot of, uh, of actors doing Bits and bytes mm -hmm. of uh, uh, what Gov Zero has uh, succeeded to do. Uh, I'm thinking, of course, of uh, names uh, most of you already know. Uh, thinking of Regard Citoyen, who made an outstanding job uh, in forcing the uh, parliament into more transparency. I'm thinking, of course, of uh, OKFN. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, OSM, who are all also very active in France, of Vox, etc., etc. But what strikes me is that they never managed to um, say, uh, attain the kind of visibility and uh, the kind of crowds uh, that you've ob obviously uh, managed to gather uh, in Taiwan. So uh, do you have a clue about what was so decisive of uh, having managing to have so many developers and citizens involved in this movement? Right. Uh, I think the, the most important thing is to, to meet face to face every month in a place that accommodates hundreds of people. Uh, this is this is like really old organization tip. <laughs> but but uh, but uh, so may maybe the the groups you mentioned already do some of that. But I think the thing with the Gov Zero hackathon is that for every hackathon of maybe 150 people, uh, maybe 100 people are the first time here or the second time. That like, like they are not very well versed. So so basically we. Um, we went viral very easily by by incorporating newcomers like every month that 
essentially doubles the size or the reach of the existing hacker community in Cov Zero. Because people who already form long-term projects, they will at least send one delegate to the Gov0 uh, large hackathon to both recruit new members and also see what synergies they could play uh, with, with other people. And, and I think this is really not about internet, this is just organization 101, organizing 101, yeah. Yes, yeah. so for the 100 people, it's in Academia Sinica, it's in the Research Institute uh, in Taiwan, and for the 50 uh, people, that's a smaller hackathon, uh, it's some place that's very much like super public, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in addition to the weekly small meetups and the monthly hackathons, we also do a summit every two years. And then for the summit, uh, we, we pay for the airfare and fly everybody across the world uh, who come. Like uh, in 2014, there's uh, Clay Shirky, and then there's uh, the Pirate Party uh, people from Germany, and then, of course, OKFN and uh, you know New Zealand, Code for All, uh, you know, all, all the usual suspects. And then, so, so they, they come to Taiwan and learn about the local context. And I think the most important thing is that they they uh, introduce the agenda they're going to do for the next year, and then it becomes part of the routine in our monthly hackathons. So we keep thinking about what kind of ties we can strengthen, usually with tools, but uh, with procedures, but sometimes also with policies uh, that we can talk with, with other international people. So this year in, in uh, May, I think 14 and 15, is our, our next uh, Gov Zero Summit, and uh, Vox will be there, and uh, Pandemos, Podemos, and, you know, a lot of European people. Yeah, we, we do take donations. Uh, our our primary cost is a very high quality food. Uh, and uh, I mean, I mean, after a hackathon, a month after a hackathon, you don't remember any of the people or project, but you will remember the food. If the, if the food is very bad or it's very good, it, it gives a lasting impression. And so, and, and this is true, I mean, internationally, all the, um, I think I read a comparison study on Occupy movement that, that says, you know, it, it makes or breaks it occupied based on the, the food station that they have. Uh, I think it's an exaggeration, but it is also somewhat true. So in, in, in any case, we, we spend a lot of uh, money on, on food. And so we do take donations, and the donations gets you a guaranteed ticket. Because for the, especially for the slightly smaller venues, like 50 people or maybe 90 people, usually the ticket sold out in a matter of hours. So uh, then people would have to ask for transfer tickets and things like that. So we keep increasing the value. But then if you donate uh, something like 30 euros, you get a guaranteed ticket on the next hackathon. Uh, and then we, we only <coughs> um, ask for money that's exactly equivalent to the cost of food and the mandatory infrastructure, as you said, um, for the next month. So we don't keep any uh, cash. Um, the, the idea of unconference or, or hackathon or, or things like that is actually has nothing to do with internet. It, it has the roots in you know nonviolent communication, open space technology. The, all these things were were pre-internet things. These these were just people in a space given a time frame, do whatever they want. This is sort of anarchist self-organization kind of stuff. So so our root uh, activists, core activist groups, people were were uh, people of an uh, older generation, I think, uh, who, who did this kind of stuff, or, or at least took this kind of training, and then uh, did nonviolent resistance <coughs> in the early days of Taiwan when we still have a martial law and, and things like that. So uh, I think there's um, a lot of things that people were just um, not joining because of the lack of familiarity with tools. So, uh, for example, I insist on using something like pen and paper <laughs> because it, it's much more familiar with uh, people who are not digital natives. And also we use very large digital whiteboards, but it could be used in a way like people who used to use whiteboards uh, in, in their nonviolent communication trainings and things like that. So we try to transport the same kind of organization that uh, people did in the pre-internet days, but by making the offline space as comfortable as possible uh, to the paper uh, generation of people. But then because uh, we also 
take you know uh, live video transcripts digital uh, representations of everything that's analog uh, we also make the young people uh, aware of what uh, their earlier generation is doing um, this is may not be a entirely satisfactory answer but that was our, our core way of operating yeah. so so far so good all right so so let's move on to to the next part so, so this is a example of one of the earliest Gov Zero projects, and the uh, the one that got me into Gov Zero uh, two months after its founding. Um, and this is called a Moedict. A Moed meaning very cute, uh, right? Uh, so it's a very cute dictionary with a very cute logo, um, and. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the dictionary is um, three years old. It already becomes the the only really tool of the the primary school level Chinese education uh, in Taiwan, where people uh, teachers, especially in rural or remote island areas where they don't have the same access to library and museums, they they take uh, their students to their computer lab and use Moedic to to teach. Uh, Chinese. And Chinese as it's spoken in Taiwan, there's Mandarin, there's traditional simplified Chinese, Taiwanese holo, Taiwanese haka, that is very different uh, ways of talking about Chinese in Taiwan. And also because of the new migrants, uh, we also have uh, Tagalog and you know Indonesian uh, languages and so on. And then we also have Aborigines who are uh, enjoying a, a surge of uh, rediscovery of their own language like the Amis and other Austronesian languages. And also because of the large influence of Tibetan Buddhism, we also have people interested in Tibetan. So it's a large dictionary <laughs> with, with a lot of cross-reference between all the languages that spoken in Taiwan. Um, and uh, it's been used uh, around Taiwan. So <clears throat> the point of doing this this dictionary was uh, very typically Gov Zero. When I joined <clears throat> uh, the project, it was initiated by, by Ye Ping. He was a physics professor in the National Taiwan University and then joined Google, becomes the head of Google, Taiwan's cloud, whatever department, and then moved to, to the Valley and working now, I think, on Google Analytics. And then um, when he moved to, to the Valley with his children, he found it's very difficult to teach his children Chinese in the US, it's a very common problem. Uh, teaching Chinese is hard enough. Uh, teaching Chinese in the US is very, very difficult. And when, when we learned Chinese online, we used this Gopher site. Gopher was this pre-World Wide Web protocol that I, I'm sure not many people remember now. But uh, we used to use this kind of online dictionary that was built by the Ministry of Education. But nowadays, his children don't use Gopher anymore. And he, his children really only use um, the mobile device and the official Ministry of Education doesn't really have a mobile-friendly website, and so that makes the job extra difficult. So Ye Ping said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll just download everything from the official dictionary website, and we'll redo it in with the open API so that people can use it to make mobile websites or whatever they want with it. And actually, we have done this over the years, personally, but because it's violating copyright, we never make public of the fact. People have been doing this individually. But when, you know, GovZero came about, Ye Ping said, okay, now if 30 people are doing it, together, then it's called civil disobedience. Uh, it's not called about, it's not called copyright violation. So, um, and then become kind of a, a legitimizing movement. So so then he called uh, people to, to download this dictionary. Now the dictionary is very old, uh, it's since 45. And it's still being maintained. It's very high quality. If you want to learn about classical Chinese, which is like Latin, right? Uh, Really, this is the go-to dictionary. But because its website was built in 96 and haven't been updated uh, for 20 years, uh, it reflects a lot about the early web. Like, you cannot bookmark the URL because the idea of bookmarking hasn't been invented. And then, for example, it used a very old legacy encoding so that, uh, you know, it's like ISO a 59 A lot of Unicode characters just cannot be displayed, so they use pictures, uh, which means copy and paste is not possible. 
possible. And also, it hasn't been designed for the mobile web because there were no mobile web. And if you view the source, it says it's best view with IE5 or Netscape 4.7+. Uh, and the plus is meaningless because Netscape uh, discontinued after 4.7. So, so it's a very old website that hasn't been um, kept up with times. And also, <coughs> it locks you out after 30 minutes of disuse. And it will pop out something that says you can, uh, you're going to be redirected to the homepage. And it's true for all the Ministry of Education dictionaries ever since. But the catch is that there is no login button. So th this is a website that you cannot log in, but it locks you out every half an hour. <coughs> it's ridiculous. So. Um, so uh, Ye Ping had a vision, and then we had a collaborative edited, it's like Google Doc, what we call Hackpad. So he wrote everything that needs to happen, and then went to, to sleep. And then we had our 100 people hackathon, and then people joined, and then just crowdsourced, downloaded everything. And then I created this spreadsheet that lists all the pictures and asked people to fill in their Unicode. Uh, and it brought down Google spreadsheet. And it, it will become a pattern that whenever Gov0 mobilize somebody, uh, some project on a new platform, that platform will, will go down. And so we're like the scalability testers of, of new services. <laughs> and so uh, we, we had to uh, create our own uh, spreadsheet. It's called EtherCalc to to complete uh, this work. But within 24 hours, uh, everything's downloaded, made into an open API, cross-linked, uh, made into browser extensions, mobile web, everything. Because it's like rough consensus. People just have a general direction and then shared whatever we we have. But what about the copyright? So. Um, uh, a few years before we did this, the Creative Commons people introduced a new Creative Commons device called Creative Commons Zero. Um, and the Creative Commons Zero plays nicely with the name Gov Zero. So, so we, we, we were the popularizers of this idea. And the CC Zero means that we abandon completely the copyright, not even attribution, right? And not even anything. So it's as if it enters the public domain uh, the, the second we publish something. And the reason why we could do this is because we used a loophole in the Taiwan copyright law that says a government publication, if it's used in a non-profiting uh, fair use doctrine, then part of it may be reused without criminal uh, penalties. But the problem with fair use, of course, is how much is too much. And we're using 100% of the data. So we had to relinquish 100% of our copyright. So we're not using uh, doing derived work. We're technically just converting formats for the government. So a complete reuse warrants a complete uh, abandonment of copyright. And then we argue under the Taiwan Fair Use Doctrine that this is fair use. And uh, we are hundreds of people, so this really is civil disobedience. And then we, we wait for the ministry to, to respond to, to our claim. But uh, while we were waiting for the ministry, uh, we, we started to discover that when we make things like the PDF copies of the campaign finance records or the paper dictionaries into you know very fine-grained data, we could start to build communities around that. This is the idea of what we call social object. For each uh, word in the dictionary, we now have a well-known URL. For the Chinese word ziliao, meaning data, the permanent link is just moedictw slash ziliao. So there's no need to remember its web address. Its web address is a word. And then with that, we can do what Tim Bernsley says, five-star data. When you mouse over uh, any word in the definition, it will pop out using a link data format, whatever they could find uh, in the same dictionary or in the you know um, wiki dictionary or the, you know, uh, uh, open dictionary, uh, anything that's linked to this word. And so people start sharing those words on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, on social media. Now, when people start writing something like this is open data workshop, this is not a word yet in the dictionary. So uh, instead of showing, you know, for, for not found, we show a segmentation that shows the definition of open and then data and then workshop. And then we generate a open graph image that is a beautiful calligraphy of whatever the word the, the person wrote. And so this solves a very important problem of internet social media campaigners, because it's very difficult to find a photo that fits your message that is also free of copyright. Right? And people usually spend 
you know, half an hour looking at the proper image because without an image, it doesn't get the same kind of shares and virality. So now people just type whatever they want and then use that as a kind of banner to their message and to improve virality. And if you think calligraphic is not good enough for your message, then you can switch to any of those open phones. So, so this is how we get 7 million visits per month. This is not people who want to look up definition in dictionary. This is people who want to use it as, you know, holding banners, protests, uh, you know, campaigners, things like that, who want to share their message in a very clear way that kind of just hacks the, the Facebook ranking system. So, um, and the good thing about this is that when they click into the definition, they can share it again and again on social media. Now, with 7 million visits per month, we can now call people to action because even just our conversion rate is 0.1%. That is a lot of people still, right? So when, whenever we put a call to action on the top right corner of the Moe Dictionary, thousands of people come. And so, for example, we have a, um, this is a Aborigine uh, Amis and Fosse dictionary that was done in the 60s. And all we have is this low quality scan. So again, we do the same thing as the open finance record. We split into you know rows and ask people to type whatever they see. They don't have to know Amis or Fosse. They just have to you know type in Latin characters. <clears throat> and then we finish that very quickly in uh, 53 hours. So it's this thick of a dictionary and then turned into a digital dictionary for the Aborigine people. And then people take pride saying, you know, we're saving a culture just by typing random words on the internet. And, and then the, the other project that we did was that the Ministry of Education, before they respond to our um, legal case, they had their own exercise in asking people for corrections to their dictionary. And we thought it's a very good uh, chance to demonstrate. So we had 18 days in that event. And then we wrote a program that looks at the citations in dictionary where two entries cite the same source. And the fragment of the sentence they cite example differ by only one word. And so these kinds of things usually means a typo. Uh, when the people were first digitizing it. One of the two citations is perhaps a typo. Now, a program knows which one uh, is different, but it doesn't know which one is correct. So we put a call to action for people to click on the search button, which looks to Google, to see whether it's being used somewhere else or just in this dictionary, in which case it's a errata, right? It's a typo. And so we identify more than 5,000 typos this way, just by crowdsourcing people uh, to, to, to do this work. So um, the ministry had received maybe 6,000 typos, and uh, 5,600 were from the Moya Dictionary. And so this uh, proves that we are not just consumers. We are also contributors. We can do proofreading, we can do crowdsourcing. The Ministry of Education decides this is totally fair use <laughs> because <laughs> because if they, they, they rule against this, they're not just ruling against um, 30 hackers or 100 hackers. They're ruling against um, thousands of people who contribute to this way of reclaiming our language. And this is a constituency that they, the Ministry of Education really cannot alienate. So they very swiftly decided, okay, this is a very good idea. So <coughs> the, to recap shortly, um, the way the ministries, the committees, the associations, in the pre-internet era, usually work by coordinated consensus. People have to know everybody in the same committee. When some person joins, they have to know everybody else also. But the problem with the, the human wetware is that uh, after the 20s people or so, uh, people stopped having the same uh, egalitarian relationship. Some people become just listeners, right? And then you have hierarchy, bureaucracy, and things like that. So. The way we fix this is by rough consensus. As I talk about in the dictionary, every dictionary uh, language people, I don't actually speak those languages. So it's those indigenous groups. They all just take whatever I built for Moedict or Yeping built for Moedict and then use it to apply to their own material, their data. They don't have to ask our permission. But then maybe <clears throat> they try something that's a good idea. And then those ideas become adopted by other languages, dictionaries. And because everything is open source, it's very easy for us to cross-link 
uh, our outputs together. And if some fringe dictionaries try something that's really not a good idea, they could still do that themselves. It's just nobody else merge this kind of change. So this kind of rough consensus moves everybody generally toward the same direction and allows people who are usually enemies, uh, like competing for, for the dialect resources on education, like the, the various dialects of Taiwanese Hakka, and I'm sure things like that happen over the world, they, they could now work not as friends, but as collaborators uh, by working on their own language and then cherry picking each other's good ideas and contributions. So that's how we scale. <coughs> and not only among the uh, dictionary hackers, but also with the ministries, with the dictionary sources, because when they are finally, after 20 years, revising their website, they could now build on our Unicode mapping, they could build on our interface, they could build on our uh, crowdsource corrections, so they don't really have to spend that much of taxpayer money on this infrastructure work, because it's, the community has done that for them, and so they could merge back our work. And so indeed, uh, in um, I think two years after the Moedict, uh, the Ministry of Education education decided to open up all their dictionary data under Creative Commons license. So we don't even have to argue about fair use anymore because it's Creative Commons. And again, uh, we did the same thing with the open data portal. Uh, we had an open data portal that really sucks. And uh, so um, it's data.govtw. So naturally, we did data.gov0.tw, where you can look at the same open data metadata, but it's done in a very useful way, and that allows contribution and feedback in an open license. And then the National Development Council, who's in charge of the open data portal, merged back our open data license which is unheard of uh, in Taiwan. This has never happened in Taiwan in any level of uh, government. They changed their open data license to the Gov0 license that's compatible with Creative Commons. And the, the net gain of this is that uh, in the OKFN uh, Open Data Global Index, Taiwan raised from the 11th place to the first place because magically all the data that were not open by the open definition are open by open definition. Uh, so, so and, and that's a simple merge did uh, this kind of thing. So again, it's a fork and merge thing. Or for example, the first Gov0 project was a visualization of the national budget. And then using the PDF and Word files of the national budget, we show it as a tree map, as a bubble map. And if you click on it, you can say you want more, you don't understand, you want a cut, or that you want to a deletion of this project, and then people can have a discussion. And then if you click into it, you see the, the raw details. Now, the national government has not adopted it yet, but then the Taipei city government did last year. And then they published all their um, budget in the Gov0 compatible format, in this format. And then when people click on it and use their Facebook credentials to, to talk about a budget, like uh, you, you say you build a stadium here, but I don't see any construction, or my school's repairing problem, now, and things like that, right? People were just converging over individual budget items as social objects. And much to their surprise, after a month, every bureau office replied <laughs> on this platform. They bypassed the council entirely. They, they just replied to all the objective questions. They replied to the general feeling. They replied to the idea explaining why the budget is done this way. And so, so it, it, it's a very magical moment where the, the citizens in Taipei suddenly sees that whatever they, they type randomly on the internet uh, gets an official response from the city government. And then after this, which went all over the national press, um, then the, the other five city, major city in Taiwan all, all sign on on this platform. And now this becomes a just a regular thing uh, in Taiwan politics. So that's, again, another case of merging uh, the Gov0 um, community's contributions to the public era. So yeah, that's another 20 minutes. Any questions? Lots of ideas. Yes. Um, so let's go straight to the next section. Um, the next section is about um, the other direction. We have been talking about using civil technology to make government's data more open, more transparent, more clear. But that is like you know improving only the bandwidth of the downloading speed of your internet connection. So it's now 10 megabits per second, but you can still only upload uh, two bits every four years. That's voting, uh, right? So, so it, it's very asymmetrical, right? So uh, the other part is about uh, making citizens' voice heard and in a much more scalable way. 
And um, um, academically, the, the problem was not that the government doesn't provide sufficient information, is that it only provides to, I don't want to say the lobbyists, but the lobbyists <laughs> in, in, in the private sector. But because they, they're linked together, you know, they, they have a natural um, synergy because they have their own industry chain, so that any information that's valuable to it is also valuable to its vendors and its customers. It's very natural. That's how the private sector works. And then uh, the civil society, of course, joins this kind of committee with individual scholars, committee members, and so on. The problem is that uh, the early stage decisions, they, they don't actually have the same um, accessibility to the people in the barricades, sorry, in the streets. Uh, that is the, the larger civic society. First, because it's too too professional. Uh, the, the scholars, the academics here, are invited exactly because they could understand the jargons, the technical terms, the all the context that has gone before, and so on. And these were not very easily understood by the general civic society. And then the next thing is that it's not presented in a way that is um, costs only one minute or five minute of people's attention. And you know, it's the same problem that we talk about uh, with open data. If you cannot uh, let people know how it is relevant to them in one minute's time, then it, it's not relevant to them. And then when they got um, impacted, it's already passed resolution, right? There's a, a great uh, fable about this in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I will not repeat here. <laughs> but the, 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 the idea is that it's just too far away for, for ordinary people. Um, and this um, is a case uh, where we kind of demonstrated this. This is what we call the Zero's um, Sunflower Digital Camp, because this is a demonstration of the direct electronic democracy people uh, demonstrating to the parliament how should we talk about uh, trade agreements. <coughs> so Sunflower movement is a prime example of the citizens uh, not noticing anything until it's too late. Uh, the political context is this. China wants to sign a uh, cross-strait trade agreement with Taiwan. And it, it has very favorable terms because it has political agenda. And the Taiwan administration wants to sign, but many legislators don't. It, there's a disconnect. Uh, usually when we sign trade agreements with, say, New Zealand or Japan or whatever other countries, there is a process. The legislation has a committee, there has a public hearing, you know, the usual process. But because constitutionally in Taiwan, Beijing is part of Taiwan. So, so um, and we haven't changed our constitution yet. So uh, by the Taiwan constitution, this is signing a pact with a domestic local city government. And any administration's pact with a domestic city government doesn't have to go through the legislation, of course, because otherwise the legislation will, will have infinite things to, to, to talk about. Right? So with this constitutional loophole, the administration argues that the legislation has no say in this agreement because Beijing is part of Taiwan. And then they could sign whatever they want and the uh, uh, legislation could have public hearing, but after 30 days of inaction, it automatically passes because it's a city-level domestic um, agreement. Oh. Now, of course, nobody really thinks of things this way. E even the, the pro-unification people don't think of things of this, this way. This is entirely a constitutional loophole. But because of this loophole, the legislation is powerless. They said, we, we don't have the, the code of law that authorizes us to talk about this trade service agreement. So it becomes automatically passed after uh, a certain number of days. Now, on that night um, in the street, there's a large demonstration. And then uh, I, I was supporting the internet connection for the demonstration. But before we talk about that particular night, uh, we, we can talk about a more evolved 2.0 form of the same platform, which took place in Hong Kong a few months after that. This is Occupy Central, um, so-called Umbrella Revolution. 
Um, it's called the world's politest protesters. Uh, the the same headline used for the sunflower movement, um, and <laughs> um, and I was in Dusseldorf at that time, uh, and then I was just typing into Twitter, and then it it had this projector that project into the uh, Occupy Central building, whatever people tweeted, uh, so so that people could feel that they're they're. Uh, they're there. Now, uh, a journalist uh, deploying Hong Kong said that, wow, the website of the Occupy has got to the most technological advance in history. And then his friends was like, wait, I have seen this website before. <laughs> and then Steel Gao, co-founder of GovZero, said, yeah, this is forked from our GitHub. So basically, the logistic systems was forked from the Sunflower movement. It's exactly the same code uh, with some more modifications. What it does is that it provides the live broadcast, the map, the news, and the logistics. The map shows in real time the, the barricades, the, the you know police forces, the gathering points, the medical first aids. There's a lot of rumors. So there's the rumor and there's the actual facts and it's showing a timeline correlated to the uh, geographic information. And there's also um, cameras that the citizens have set up so people can watch four or nine cameras at a time and have a chat room next to each of it. And then there's a spreadsheet that uh, every column is the occupied place and every row is the supply that they need. So just looking at this spreadsheet, you know how the occupy is going on uh, and what uh, extra uh, logistics or supplies is being needed or being moved from places to places. So this is a, a really nice system. Uh, and uh, this is what Clay Shirky calls a situational application, a, a state app, because None of this is possible if you only use Facebook and Twitter and Google+. This system literally is being coded on the ground. And every day, we change the code to adjust for the need of that day and then used for the next day. So during the Occupy, this entire system got rewritten any number of times. And this prototype was first done uh, in uh, March that that year for the anti-nuclear force plant uh, protest and uh, we worked with the cable uh, electricity radio team in Gov Zero to provide uh, the protesters a, a high-speed internet link uh, because the last year there's a lot of people almost a quarter million to that protest so we expect a lot of use for the media for the internet and so on unfortunately on that day, there's a large typhoon in, in Taiwan, and only one tenth or less people came because it was just raining cats and dogs. And so, so nobody used the internet. So we had a lot of spare bandwidth uh, to use. And then it occurred to us that we can just channel the, the SDI connection from the, uh, the, the show that's on the stage and broadcast it on, on YouTube, which the YouTube Live was actually just introduced for general uh, consumption uh, a few weeks before that. So we're one of the first users. And now we discovered that, wow, uh, hundreds of people joined, even we don't announce this beforehand because it was totally uh, in the field. And then uh, quickly, people, because they feel guilty, they couldn't go on the street because of the typhoon, <laughs> crowded over the, the chat room. And then there's eventually more people there than people around the stage. And then we thought, wow, this this is something that, that we could work on, right? And so with this exactly the same equipment, 10 days after that uh, is the occupied um, parliament. We don't even have to change the code. It was just deployed uh, as is. and. But this is different because um, on the right hand side the, here was the original protest where uh, I thought I would just supply the internet connection and then some other people supply the camera and we'll protest for a night or maybe one or two days and then go home. Uh, that was the original plan. And then while I was <coughs> doing this broadcast, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, the person who, the student who lent me this laptop uh, says, I'm not going to use my laptop anymore, so use it for, for the broadcasting station. I'm like, you you look like a university student. What kind of university student says, I don't need my laptop anymore? Um, well, the kind that 
climbs over walls <laughs> because it's too heavy. The, the occupiers uh, only use MacBook Air. And any, anything that's heavier than that was left on the streets. And then they, they just cross over the, the walls of the parliament building and then broke into it and occupied the parliament. And because nobody was expecting that. And so there only was, was one or two police stationed there. So they were very successful in, in just occupying. And so the first uh, hour or so, uh, we had the camera crew who were supporting the anti-nuclear protest um, deploying uh, their recording uh, devices that captured the, the first uh, batch of people who broke into the parliament. And that footage proved to be very important because the next day, all the mainstream media said they're mobsters. Uh, they damaged things or they were, you know, drunkards or, you know, the usual mainstream media uh, way of doing things. But because we have the, the life and the first uh, uh, first-hand footage, it just becomes very easy to show that that was not actually the case. And so for the next 20 days, it becomes a show of force between the civic media and the mainstream media. Um, and the civic media um, was based on the occupiers. They set up their own uh, live so-called sandal um, broadcasting station uh, using uh, Ustream. And then the two sides of the streets were using YouTube live. And then uh, use the same logistics to system. We ask anybody who couldn't come to the protest to listen to one of the three feeds and then type whatever they heard uh, to this collaborative type hackpad. And then the people who know, um, you know, French or English or Arabic or whatever other languages, then took this transcript and then put it their translation work on this shared spreadsheet, coordinating a translation task force. And that is how the people from abroad know about this uh, Occupy in real time, and they could check with their own eyes that the live uh, stream is actually doing uh, what they uh, are saying they're doing. And then we used a crowdsource bookmark to uh, collect anything and everything in the civic media pertaining to this movement. And uh, the same designer who designed the GovZero logo designed the Occupy logo. And then, so, so all this happened in the first 24 hours. And so that was at the night. <clears throat> so the mainstream media didn't have time. So the first agenda setting power was set by the civic media. And we were saying, this is constitutionally absurd. We will retreat when the legislative body agree to uh, talk about this trade agreement the same way we talk about any other foreign trade agreements. So unlike other occupies, we have a very narrow goal. And this narrow goal is very reasonable to most of the people. And because it was made uh, very apparent in the first 24 hours, there's very little mainstream media could do after that. Now, then we run into the same thing any occupy runs into, namely, uh, a lot of people who spread rumors, a lot of people who were like, um, uh, they were already there, like some of them homeless people, but some of them not exactly homeless people, but mobsters and, and things like that. You know, all the Occupy run into people like these. And then um, the way we fix this is that um, when there were rumors spread that uh, uh, inside the, the occupied area, were being attacked by police. It was a rumor designed to get the people on the outside because they were counter surrounding the police to attack the police and escalate uh, the conflict. And then the, the leader, one of the student leaders, had to come out and shout that we're not actually being attacked. But it doesn't scale, right? So what we did was that uh, I brought this 300 uh, meters uh, Ethernet line, CAT6 line, um, for the CPR experts deploying on the team to make all the three Occupy areas a intranet. So this is a very high-tech way of solving a very old problem of spreading rumors. Because rumors spread because they, they were cheaper to spread than facts. So if we make facts spread cheaper than rumors, then nobody will listen to the rumors. And the way we do this is by introducing very low latency um, real-time broadcasting equipments and then have a projector just like this projected on the two walls of the uh, parliament. So everything that happens in the parliament is being uh, broadcast in real time with just 20 millisecond delay uh, to the two streets. And then people don't usually listen to the audio, right? So we had uh, 
um, stenographers, people who type whatever they, they hear in the Occupy area. And so the live feed of everything that was said was displayed here. So people could see very easily what is actually going on. And people who listen to the broadcast could then correlate this to fact check our uh, stenographer so that they don't miss anything. And if they miss anything, they could just type it on the heck pad. So, so this is a, a idea what we call the transparent wall. Uh, and eventually the Occupy area also had two projectors projecting the two streets. And so it's as if the walls are not there. It's as if the police are not there, that the three Occupy sites become uh, the single Occupy site. Now, the way um, the code, so to speak, that we do this is we repurpose the idea of ne neutrality, <laughs> saying that we, we, we're providing the service that uh, upholds the constitutional right of communication. In the Occupy area, there, there were three neutral roles. There's the doctors protecting the health of both the police and uh, student protesters and everybody, and there's the lawyers protecting the due process, and we said that we're the you know, ICT people protecting the right to communicate because people who were trapped there, they don't have access to high-speed internet. And high-speed internet is a human right. So, so we're just protecting that particular human right without involving in any particular agenda. So um, and on that day, um, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that flash mobs are legal. They don't need a permit. So because of that, we uh, asked the telecommunication company to have a 50-50 um, megabits high uh, speed fiber optic link to the streets. And this is the first request to the streets that they have received. And they granted that because they, they really also want to see the live video. Everybody's watching the live video. So then we not only have the internet, but also it has been connection to the uh, outside. Uh, extranet, and that enabled uh, a lot more participation uh, across the walls. And uh, on the 24th, um, a bunch of students uh, decided to also occupy the administration building, which is a very bad idea. But in, in any case, they, they got repelled. But uh, on the same uh, time, they got repelled by the police. Uh, we got our first cyber attack on all our cyber infrastructures. Now, uh, it be becomes very fortunate that we only use tools that cost zero uh, money. So all it takes is a, a C name, a, a name change of the domain point to the different IP, and then it goes online uh, in an hour. Uh, so we had a disaster recovery plan. But for the physical uh, occupiers to the administration, we have people uh, using an iPad and a WiMAX connection to, to, to take live footage of the entire process, just like uh, we did on the initial Occupy of the Parliament. Now there's two sides of the uh, administration building. And then the, the one side that you know, people broke the window and who, who had the camera uh, looking at it, they behave very civilly. All, all the police um, moving in here and all the students moving in here, they, they were kind of a standoff, they were shouting, they were just breaking of glass, but they were very civilized, so to speak. But then this part with no live internet, uh, live stream coverage with tens of thousands of people watching, uh, the police brutality was very brutal. So um, now, so we learned, of course, people behave differently under camera and not under camera. I, I, I'm sure everybody knows about this, but we learned very painfully that this is really the case. So after that, it becomes a, a kind of top priority for us to ensure not only the three Occupy areas, but practically every street corner in the Occupy area and the vicinity are being filmed by at least three different angles in cameras. But of course, we, we don't have that many equipments. It, it's hundreds of equipments. So then we uh, did another situational application. This is a civic journalist badge generator. If you upload your photo and type your name, it will print you a badge that says you're a reporter. And, uh, and this is useful because um, just a, a couple years ago, uh, there's a Supreme, Supreme Court ruling that says uh, the reporter um, is generally protected under the freedom of speech. And then we have a QR code that links to on the badge that ruling that says 
Any ordinary people, as long as they're covering something that's of interest to the general public, must enjoy the same rights and permissions as any um, like media institution. And this is a, a very important Supreme Court ruling for us. Right. So, so of, because of this, we have hundreds of people just printing this and uh, sticking it to their back of their iPad, and then become civic journalists. And the, and the police can't do anything about it because if they ask or they want to detain such people, they would just tell the police to scan the QR code and <laughs> read the Supreme Court ruling. And so, so that's that's how we how we get a lot of uh, in the field cameras and how after that day there's no um, over injuries, there's nobody missing, it becomes completely non-violent. So, um, and then after people calm down, after there's no violence, then we start to deliberate. We start to actually talk about the cross strait uh, administration. Uh, and the, the rallying cry was that if the legislators don't want to deliberate in this building, we, we demonstrate for them how to deliberate this kind of thing. So, so how do we do this? We, we first write a program, and this is a Gov Zero project has been going on for eight months and just completed on the Occupy day. Uh, basically what it does is that is that if you enter your company's number or the kind of um, work that you do, it shows with a pop-up with beautiful comics that how exactly your company is going to be impacted once we sign this trade agreement. Uh, whether the Chinese people can come here, whether their investment can come here, uh, how for how long, and so on. It's like a three-panel comics that everybody can understand in 10 seconds, just the part that relates to them. And because of that, we also cross-reference uh, to because we want to, people to fact check us. So this cross links uh, from our um, company registration categories to the WTO categories, to the World Bank categories, to, and then to the Chinese categories. So it's a lot of work, but it's presented in a very friendly way. And armed with this kind of uh, data, people started to, to deliberate. To, to really talk about which part of agreement are good or, or bad, right? And then um, in the three occupied uh, streets, it's broadly speaking, the uh, separatists, the independentists, and the, the green people, uh, people environmentalists, and the left people who care about the workers' rights. Those are the three main concerns about this trade agreement. And the, the trick is that these three people were not friends before the Occupy. <laughs> they don't usually talk to each other. There were a lot of schism for some reason uh, be between those three camps of people. But because of the common interest and because of this deliberate a framework and because whatever anybody says on one street is then typed into transcript and viewed on another street, people start to gather more and more consensus by the day. And so um, after the, the administration refused to uh, meet with the students' demands, uh, there was a massive protest. And by that time, everybody in Taiwan has seen our live broadcasts and transcripts. So on that day, there's half a million of people. The, the entire Taipei city was like this. Yes. And when people came, when this many people came, we, we have to find something useful for them to do, right? So depending on the side of the street they sit down with, the environmentalists start debating about the environmental uh, impact of the CSSTA. The leftist people start debating about the farmland, uh, farmer, or some, some other kinds of impacts that this will have eventually, the publisher, and so on. And then the separatists talk about the constitution, basically. And so you can join any part and then uh, just have a discussion which is then captured on the online forum. So that's how the Occupy uh, turned people who don't usually speak to each other into a coherent, rough consensus kind of crowd after 22 days. And the legislative body, the head of the legislative, eventually said, OK, uh, we agree with whatever you said. Uh, and then we just retreated uh, very peacefully. That was the story of the sunflower. Uh, I have a question on uh, the transnational circulation on, of these tools. You, you mentioned Hong Kong, but I'm wondering um, how China reacted to uh, this broadcast. And maybe um, with Lumio, do you have um, relationships with South America or Spain, the demos, maybe? Yes. Uh, so I think that, that there's three uh, different layers. The, the process, the, the tools, uh, are, are international by definition. 
we we don't develop any of this. We we just apply it, right? So so yeah, they got very valuable feedback by like for example, Hackpad uh, went down five times because it was over capacity. So they have to uh, buy a special cluster for Gov Zero, so so that, that it doesn't impact their other paying customers. So uh, there's a lot of live feedback for for uh, crowd testing like this that then improves the quality of the tools because those tools was just not tested for the scale before and that's the easy part and the policy part uh, which I'll talk about in my next talk after this is the Uber part which I think has some kind of uh, relationship also with the European cities in particular uh, which there's some kind of collaboration possible but it's harder than just the tools and then of course there's the power structure level which don't usually uh, collaborate on, on this uh, regard. So, so yeah, uh, the idea of Gov Zero Summit is just to to make all the civic hackers make clear what's their agenda for the next year. But it doesn't mean that this agenda always align, uh, especially in the power level. Yeah. And for you've been traveling through uh, the world basically uh, for two years. Um, do you have maybe an example of a uh, like concrete uh, collaboration with another uh, country? Oh, sure. Really? Uh, you mean besides Hong Kong, which may or may not be a country, uh, depending on who you ask. So, <laughs> yes, um, we we do have a lot of uh, work with with the New Zealand people, uh, the developers of, of Lumio, because um, they they always wanted some way of trans transforming this, not just as a inner group decision where everybody knows everybody is that a kind of coordinated consensus model where Lumio is proven to work, but it's not proven to work with strangers, right? And so the, the same uh, issue pertains to the Seattle startup called Polis, which I'll talk about shortly. They're trying to work with the media, like New York Times, uh, to, to have people deliberate meaningfully on policies, but again, with strangers, or with celebrities who are effectively strangers. Yeah, and, and so, so these two, I think, are the closest uh, collaboration we have by developing both the theories and also the experiments uh, that will scale them from the uh, individual uses from civil society to something that would comfortably appear on mainstream media and have people with only you know five seconds to sp spare in mainstream media to still engage them in a meaningful way. I think that's the main um, direction. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts, questions? Yes. So, so yeah. On, on that scale, well, there's Pandemos, uh, which is a very comparable scale, right? Uh, at the beginning of the Five Star Movement, uh, it, it's a very comparable scale on the, <clears throat> especially the the city uh, government level. But I, I think what's unique about about the the Sunflower Movement is that this is not really about civic technology. Civic technology is just an amplifier uh, for, for really everybody who are against this kind of black box, uh, you know, policy making to, to show them an alternative. So it requires, uh, what, what I like to say, for example, with the campaign finance, you don't see this kind of crowdsourced campaign finance digitization in the UK or in Europe or in the US because they were already digital. <laughs> We don't need, uh, you know, a hundred thousand people uh, doing this work because the government is doing what a modern government should do. But on the other hand, in say North Korea or you know other countries, um, it, it doesn't take a hundred thousand people. As long as you have ten people, you get imprisoned. So, so th it requires both a, a very active young civic tech uh, population and also a very not so modern, uh, stuck in the paper era, just recently democratized um, um, country or state apparatus. So, so I, I think this is actually comparable to Spain to, to some degree. But, but unless you have this kind of um, power structure that is uh, um, behind the time government versus a new democratization civil society, then, then you get you don't get the same uh, mobilizing power as the Sunflower Movement. I hope I answer your question. Yeah. So Sunflower <coughs> showed very concretely that as, as long as we have a mediation space that is built with 
uh, ICT technologies with real-time broadcast, transcription, you know, projectors, whatever, uh, what we call reflective open space, uh, then the private sector can join pol policy discussion with the civic society on a kind of equal uh, way. Uh, so after the, the Occupy, uh, the prime minister resigned uh, after a a loose watershed loose in the um, national um, city level election, and the new prime minister is an engineer. His vice uh, deputy prime minister, a Google engineer, uh, and then um, so so we have techno. Uh, running the country after that election. And they know that they only have one year of time because everybody knows the Nationalist Party will lose on the next presidential election this year. So they have a year of time and they cannot actually take any new directions because they're going to lose the next election anyway. So so what, what could they do? <laughs> so, um, and very wisely, I think, they, they set their uh, national agenda to open government, uh, and meaning that all the civic servants, non-elected people, just normal civic servants, uh, who are not good yet at listening to the people through the internet or speaking to people through the internet, must learn this skill. And so we have a lot of training programs and training centers like this one, uh, who train all the levels of civil servants uh, in, in the art of using the internet to, to speak and listen. And then, um, it because it changes uh, the relationship of government versus people, one of the, the primary uh, issue here is the open data policy. Because using, uh, and without getting too technical, Taiwan is a um, civil law modeled after the Germany a legal system. So, so any contract between the government and people is actually not a contract. So uh, when people want to make the government everything open data, it, it runs into a, some legal problems because then it, it's like the government giving away assets. But people don't really um, want government to give away assets because it's taxpayer money and, and so on. But then because they really want to, to change the open government, they have to change the regulations so that they could legally uh, say any data the government produced is open data. And now <clears throat> they have to work with the civil society on it and the lawyers and so on. So that became their uh, primary agenda. Uh, the new prime minister has three agenda, which is open data, crowdsourcing and big data. So it's a very engineering view of a country. So uh, so with this agenda, they, they now need ways to engage the civil society, largely with the same people who help the Sunflower Movement, to talk about the things that they want to change the country in this year that is not political, that is not um, affecting the election or that is not affecting the, you know, pro-independence or pro-unification, you know, those ideologically debates. All of these things are the things that people would care about, regardless of the, you, whether you're on the left or on the right or whatever. These are the infrastructures of, of a country. So they <coughs> they initially didn't want to talk about Uber and Airbnb, but we eventually did. So <laughs> initially, these are the so-called e-regulations that pertains to the people in the cyberspace. Now, um, that's a GovZero project. The, the minister came to the hackathon as a normal hacker and took three minutes and says, so we want to solve this problem of talking about policy with people. And we know, we're aware that there are initiatives like the Cornell Euro making, like the, I, I don't know, Estonian, uh, Icelandic, uh, you know, all the you know, academics have written about any uh, Euro making initiative has a lot of barriers. And in short, there are three barriers. Um, first is that Normally, the lawmakers are not the stakeholders, and the stakeholders are not aware of the lawmakers. And the second, people are not used to debating meaningfully online. People are used more to post cat pictures. And um, that's a fact. And then the third, uh, all the policies are interlinked. So if you really want to understand a policy change, it's an overloading of information. It's impossible to without training in public administration and, and, and legal code to know exactly how a word change uh, affects the, the entire legal system. So these are, are very difficult things, and to, which is why most of the e-consultation uh, projects fail. 
And as a very concrete example, uh, one of the um, tele sorts um, laws that they want to change is the, the the telecommuting law, and the law that pertains to people who work at home and uh, people who are early stage startup funders that want to employ people who work at home and want some stock uh, and so on. And uh, uh, when we, <coughs> after the election, <coughs> when they said, of course, <coughs> of the new government, <coughs> they got some GovZero people to talk with the, the labor ministry. And they said, okay, we have this new agenda and we want to hold public hearings because that's what ministries do. And then usually they invite the head of the, the labor unions and the associations of the industry and so on. So please recommend uh, representatives of all the teleworkers in Taiwan. There's no such thing. There couldn't be such thing because a, a, a coder who work at home, a designer who work at home, a musician who work at home are completely different kind of people. Uh, they couldn't really speak for other people who work at home. It's not a trade. There's no trade union for this trade. And again, for people who are early stage, like Kickstarter uh, companies, they also don't have a, a guild or an association because they have trouble paying the next month's salary. There's uh, like forming a, a representative unit is not their game, right? So, so they couldn't hold a public hearing in the usual way. And if they just invite their scholars or the people they know, then everybody will say, this is lobbying and, and this has no legitimacy, right? <clears throat> and they were very afraid that if they invite the wrong people, <clears throat> they would get occupied again. This was like the, the always something that hanging above their heads. So, so, um, so they, they really want some way that's both legitimate and could talk to the legislation, which was deadlocked by the two parties. They were filibustering each other. And so without ways to do normal public hearing, they come to the GovZero hackathon. And the minister, Jacqueline, who was head of the IBM legal department, Asia, uh, she's a um, technology lawyer. That's her first time working in the government under the, the new uh, administration. And so he's, uh, she's like, OK, let's think of this as a, a coding problem as a, a engineering problem. We want to reach everybody who register their companies in Cayman Islands. And we want to ask them, why do, do you register at Cayman Islands? Uh, and we want everybody who plan to register at Cayman Islands to tell us if we change the law in Taiwan, what parts of law should we change so that you don't have to register in Cayman Islands? And, and this is an engineering problem, a, a social computing problem, really. And so this has a technical solution. And so I'm aware, actually, <coughs> that there is <coughs> something very similar in the, in, in the France. And <coughs> there's also a shift from the civil law to the <coughs> kind of US, UK kind of law for this kind of companies. <coughs> but so for the scholars and the uh, startups, people, and so on, we set up this uh, discussion board. And we model it explicitly after the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, in which anybody who posts anything constructive to this discussion, there were a hundred or so, uh, are invited to the working group. So, so people who are in the working group are just people who, who contributed to the online discussion. So we use the online discussion as a way to self-select people who would eventually form the working group committee. So after a month, uh, we hold a consultation, and then we have um, like lawyers and academics in both uh, tradition of the law, and then uh, the ministries of economy, finance, whatever, and then uh, of all the people who contributed on the online discussion, there were maybe 10 or 20 people, they sat down, and then we used the same sunflower um, um, infrastructure to to broadcast everything, and then to take a live feed and a real-time transcript, and then, oh, and, Everything is captured like that so that the entire nation knows that uh, we're talking about this thing. And then a week after that, the working group forms and then using input from the ministries and from the uh, academics of the, the tolerance limit, like how much would they tolerate, uh, like multiple votes per share or uh, how much they would tolerate um, the stocks, options that are non-capital uh, based and so on. So using these uh, terms, we then talk about a request for comment uh, document, which again, in an IETF way, uh, consists of 
we are not lawyers, but if the lawyers are going to pass this law, it must contain this, it must not contain this. It should contain this, should not contain this, it may contain this, may not contain this. So the same um, habit as we do on the internet. Now, uh, this is very thoroughly debated over the, the month and a half. So by the time we send this to the Ministry of Economy Affairs, all they did was to translate this recommendation to legalese. And because of the design of our system, they have to uh, cross-relate each point in our recommendation to their translated legalese. So it becomes the first bill in which that every bill cross-links to the recommendation uh, where it was brought from, and the, the recommendation then was correlated to the uh, discussion and the consultation points. And so when that was sent to the, by that time, deadlocked parliament filibustering everything, um, this was passed in a week. This is like the, the only bill that they would not dare to block because there is already social consensus. And again, just like the Ministry of Education would agree that our use is fair use, any party that says no is running against thousands of people who already expressed their consensus on this matter. So unless the parliament can find additional facts or additional reflections that our working group has not considered, there is really no reason for them to block this bill. So it was passed, and so it was made law. So the, the way we do working group meetings is, again, like in the Sunflower Movement, uh, we uh, separate the discussion points into the objective, the facts, the feelings about those facts, and then the ideas. And then we use a, a font that has six different bold levels to show the, the strengths of consensus of online discussion. So with just one glance, you can see what the consensus was about. And then for working group members who could, who could participate, maybe 10 people here, uh, we would speak in turn for maybe 20 minutes about one section of the law. And then we switch to the hackpad to the um, e-participation because not everybody live or could travel to Taipei. So whatever they typed then become read aloud and like a agenda for another 20 minutes. So the, the idea is that it's like telepresence. Uh, you, you're guaranteed to get a sufficient amount of time whether you're uh, in the same place or whether you're uh, on the internet. And so Again, everything that everybody says was captured with this My Society tool called Say It. So you can link to one specific utterance in the bill. So um, the design of the system was uh, very important to overcome the three walls of the e-participation by first requiring the Ministry of Economy, in this case, to put a slight uh, that is viewable within five minutes, and we ask amateur people to try to read it so that they could actually understand the, the issue at hand. And for every uh, specific jargons, like what's a closely held corporation, what's a startup, we provide a definition that's 100 or 40 uh, more, uh, less characters, like a Twitter. And then just like in the Moe Dictionary, when you hover over that word, you see a definition of that word. And this is very important because most of the online debate, we're about fighting for the definition of words. And when we do a lexicon this way, we say a startup means different thing to different people. But for the matter of this law, it means this. Please talk in this term. And so this eliminates 80% of trolls for, for some reason. And then uh, the, the other innovation, I think, was that the initial uh, mediator who interviewed the academics and the stakeholders were designed to be one person from the elected uh, official, the, the minister's office, one civic servant, uh, non-elected official, and then one or two people from the private sector who has a stake in this, like the Institute of Information uh, Industries, and one or two people from the civil society. And, and so the, this four to six people team were the initial team to who decide the time, the duration, the format, the agenda of the, the entire consultation. And this lends to a, a very balanced uh, view and, and lends to the legitimacy to the entire process because otherwise people would say this is just another way of lobbying or this is another way of protesting and we don't want either of that. 
And the, the other thing is, of course, that we, we do a mixed reality uh, debate. And also, um, and this is something very, very technical, but I think the most important of the four is that we, we use our own uh, discussion forum system. Unlike Facebook, this allows moderator to modify, to edit people's comments. And in Facebook, when you're, you're facing with a uh, comment or discuss or any other uh, foreign system, um, that has 90% good contribution, but 10% ad hominem attacks. Uh, all the editors are faced with a conundrum because if you censor that message, then people would call you out and then people would be very, very angry. But if you allow that to continue, the next reply will be 20% attack. And then the next one will be more and more toxic because people respond to the toxic parts. And then after five replies, people started posting cat pictures. And, and at that point, all discussion is lost. <laughs> so, um, so before it gets to the cat picture point, um, what we did was that uh, we, first, we have a code of conduct and a term of service that says anybody who writes online is Creative Commons licensed, and you, you agree to not to make these sort of comments. And so when people post things like that, we delete those 10%, usually just five words. And because it's version controlled, people could see that the original, if they want, is like Wikipedia, right? Uh, and then, but the normal people who join for the first time don't have to have their mind uh, polluted uh, by that. Because the, the trolls usually, they are just people craving for, for attention. They have uh, some, some gripe, right? So this is the way to teach people that only by making constructive criticism or constructive input do they get attention. Uh, and anything else automatically get them zero attention. So even if they write a long paragraph of just fighting words and so on, as long as there's one sentence in it that's contribution, we delete everything else and then keep that sentence and, and then write a private message to them saying, because you violated the code of conduct, uh, we delete these, these, these words. And then, you know, this is great. So we thank you for this contribution. And there's an old XKCD comic that says the YouTube commentary system will be vastly improving quality if the system read aloud back what they have written. Uh, and so this is our way of reading back aloud, so to speak, uh, the, the trolls. And, and they reform very quickly. Uh, and so, so we get high quality discussion. And this is a very minor technology point, but I think this is one that made the most impact in the long run. Were you trying to ask something? Uh, actually, no, uh, it's just the facilitators. So the, the initial team of maybe 10 or, or so people who built this website. Uh, and as I explained, they come from the three sectors. Uh, and so, uh, and that, that the logic is basically, if you uh, go on this website, you have to trust the system operators anyway, right? So, 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 uh, and then we have a, because it's cross-sectoral, so we serve as each other's peer reviewers. So if any editor is going out of hand, the other editors will, will call them out, right? Because they they serve different interests. So, so then we have to actually just, uh, it's like Wikipedia is very legalistic, like these behaviors are okay and these are not, and we check it against a, a long running, uh, uh, code of conduct that everybody sees on their first login. Yeah. Any other thoughts, ideas? All right. So, um, and um, usually when I when I talk with um, civic tech people in other countries, um, the first question they would ask is that, okay, you're cross sectoral, but you're privileging internet elites. You're privileging people who could make interesting, useful argument on the internet because that's your selection of the working group. So people who have a trouble logging into the internet uh, is excluded by this process. And what, by what right do the internet people have to decide for the rest of the population? Um, and so the, the usual uh, response, which we gave in our very first meeting in the hackathon, is that we don't. We, we only talk about laws that has internet users as their only stakeholders. So, so the idea is not deliberative democracy. The idea is a town hall meeting 
It's as if the internet users are a small town, and the small town is negotiating with the national government about things that concern this town's development. So, so basically, we don't take any debates, points like uh, the jurisdiction ministry very much want us to talk about gay marriage because they, they really cannot get consensus on this matter in Taiwan. But we refused again and again because there is no correlation with gay and internet use. Right? So we, we cannot say that this is about internet stakeholders. So, so, uh, so we, we keep saying no. So, so by the um, end of the, the deliberation period, uh, a lot more ministries are seeing the power of this model will suggest and will keep saying no. Uh, and the other thing is that, of course, it has to pertain about law change. This is not uh, about rallying of things that are just raising awareness or things like that. It has to be something concrete, otherwise we don't have a working group. And then, again, the ministries, when they propose something, they have to be open-ended. They cannot just propose a draft and ask the people to, to uh, underwrite the draft. They could propose some seed ideas, but that's it. And it has to allow at least 30 days for consensus to, to emerge. And so we had pretty good uh, participation. And so, uh, this is the, the very geeky slide that I usually skip. Uh, <laughs> okay. But we, we use uh, tools that are mostly free of charge. Uh, the forum system that we built uh, is literally called the Civilized Discourse Construction Kit. Uh, so it's for civilized discussions. And uh, we, we ask the ministries to publish their introductory uh, material as a slide. And then the draft and all the uh, working group meetings were kept in Gitbook. And the lexicon is kept in a Google uh, spreadsheet. And then the entire web page was done in GitHub pages. And we used different streaming providers and all the transcripts were kept on the SAIS system. And then just like any other campaign, we send every month uh, the updates to the working group members. And then uh, we use Polis for, for uh, Uber and Airbnb, which I'll talk about. But the, the core technology that we use is a, a facilitator technology called the focused conversation method. And this means that we layer our discussion in a way that talks about artifacts. And before we talk about all the facts, we don't talk about our feelings. And then we talk about everybody's reflections. And before we complete this round, we don't talk about ideas. And then we talk about ideas. And finally, uh, the decisions. <clears throat> and the reason of that is that human beings um, have a cognitive limit called the sticky choices. As long as you start to think about ideas, people lose the idea, uh, the capacity capacity to feel objectively about alternate ideas when one would start to be sticky to the idea, which is why we always just focus on these two things. And the other benefit of focusing on the facts and the feelings is that it avoids the uh, legitimacy problem that other uh, e-participations have. Because no matter how many people we could involve in, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, it's just 1% or 2% of the populace. So if we do the voting part, people would always ask, so by what right do you vote for the other people who don't show up? But when we say we're just collecting facts and the feelings for the people to, to talk about, for the civil servants to do research, for the parliament people to do research, then nobody asks this legitimacy question. So that's another uh, angle of the, the tools. So our improvements over the Cornell University Regulation Room format are, are four. First, all the ministries have usernames. Next, they all uh, in the forum. So like the Ministry of Economy is literally at MOEA. Uh, and and the, the finance uh, ministry is literally at MOF. So, so they, they have handles in, in that forum. And they agree initially as a precondition. Anybody who tags, who mentions them in any of their comments, they will reply officially in seven days. So with a, a month of deliberation period that allows at least four rounds, 
of back and forth, where for the um, civil servants, this is a platform to discover the people's uh, ideas and feelings. But for the civil society, this is a way to get facts out of the civil servants. Because if you write them privately, they don't, they don't have the peer pressure of all the other ministries watching. So for some uh, answers that, that are really face losing, like for one of the um, internet tax, the e-tax uh, issue, we, we want to check uh, the custom data for the regular importers and to see whether it's possible to build a system that identify the regular importers who evade tax, for example. And then people ask, what kind of information do we currently collect to the destination address in the airport and in the seaports? And it took seven days for the Minister of Finance to answer. Um, sorry, we're just a tax collecting agency, really. We're not really the Ministry of Finance. This is for the, the Office of Import-Export to answer. And we're like, okay, so we tag that agency. And so after seven days, they had to answer. And then they said, we, we don't have this system. We know Japan has the system, Singapore has the system, but it never occurred to us to build the system, sorry. Um, and this is not something that usually you get from either the parliamentary inquiries or from the individual civic society lobbying or anything, because it's very face-losing for them. But because they sign on this platform with this guarantee, they will lose even more legitimacy if they don't answer timely or honestly. So. Then after one or two times, they start to buy in this Gov Zero motto. It's okay to to be imperfect. That's you know there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So uh, that 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 creates opportunity for participation. And so um, then we our working group members are just people who provide constructive uh, opinions, and then we focus really on offline, online, mixed mode uh, conversation, which lends another layer of credibility because a lot of uh, policymakers and scholars and so on, they say, um, I type very slowly online. I'm handicapped if you want to do it in an online only form. So, so we say, okay, use your pen, use your uh, voice, use whatever way you feel comfortable, and we, uh, we would deploy sufficient stenographers or uh, transcribers or whatever to bring it uh, to the online era and you use whatever tool you're comfortable with. So a lot of policymakers really go on this um, platform by printing every forum post, writing their answers and having <laughs> their assistants typing them back or turning the recordings back. So there's a lot of logistics involved, but, but that's how we uh, get to be inclusive. So I think that's it for, for V Taiwan. And um, the latest news was that they're, they're uh, trying to make this into a, a really official, national, all-inclusive, um, supported by local government kind of uh, facilitation uh, platform, which is agenda for the next administration. So, so this is how we get the spirit of deliberative democracy into policy making. So before I get to the last uh, talk, which I have 15 minutes, should be sufficient. Um, any talk idea? Yes. Technically, this is very easy, right? Just fork the GitHub repository, just add water, right? But but the well, yeah. So, so every ministry is different because we build this a platform as an opt-in, right? So they don't have to bring everything here. And in fact, most of the thing we say no because it's not about internet people, right? Um, so we we build this very interestingly as a multi-stakeholder dialogue platform that saves the civil servants time and face because the Taiwan civil servants uh, is is very um, disadvantaged because it's not completely anonymous like in the UK so if something goes wrong they get punished they uh, and on the other hand we're a young democracy so whatever they gets right the elected officials get all the credit so um, so they're in a Loose, loose situation, right? Uh, if they do something wrong, they got punished. If they got something right, somebody else get the credit. So um, what, what we're trying to, to do here is basically saying, OK, all the impossible tasks that the elected officials assign to the civil servants uh, where you don't have the research capacity for, you can outsource this research to the civil society and the, and the private sector. And because of uh, your uh, professional responses 
during the consultative period, uh, you as, as civil servants get credit. Uh, over the elected officials, bypassing the parliament entirely, and so so then they they become much more willing. And then the the other benefit being that the uh, laws and regulations done this way, the elected officials be in the parliament or the administration, they they are not block. So in many senses, it's like the early participatory budgeting in Taiwan, where the um, civil servants were the main proposers. I don't know whether it's the same in Paris, but uh, a lot of the proposals were done by civil servants because they know what the city needs. But this is a additionally legitimating way for their ideas to then become the public policy. So after you know opt in and selling it in these three angles, we get all the very difficult cases like open data where the civil servants know nothing about, and so it's very willing to share the risk and retain the credit. So, uh, so whenever there is an issue like that, the buy-in is instant. It takes a day, seven days at the most. And we haven't been forcing any ministry to use this uh, method to do anything. So we don't know if there's resistance, how, how long does it take to, to do it. But this is an opt-in uh, platform, so hopefully we'll never find out. Oh, the deliberation actually is in the administration building. Uh, so uh, first, they have to have an email address that ends with gov.tw, which is very hard to get actually <laughs> for a, a, a hacker, right? <laughs> so so uh, first, they have to have that domain, and then we always do a multi-stakeholder preparatory meeting with the ministry people, so we get to meet them face to face and confirm that they are indeed the person holding the email address who, who want to propose this thing. So yeah, it's two-factor authentication, yeah. Any other thoughts, ideas? All right, we have 10 minutes to talk about Uber. Um, Uber is a challenge to the entire world. Um, and this is putting it lightly. Um, the green dots were legal. Uh, the red are illegal, but they are operating anyway. Uh, and uh, the pink are part partially legal or in, in con contention. The same uh, for Taiwan and, and France. Um, for, for Uber, we, we discovered that the v Taiwan existing process doesn't work. The, the entire illegitimacy was built on all the domestic stakeholders showing up, agreeing on the working group, so that nobody in the media or in the parliament could say, no, this is not a consensus. They could not ignore us. But the same process, if we apply it on Uber, Uber will promptly ignore us. It's, they're not a Taiwan company. They're, they don't even have a Taiwan operation office. Um, so even if we confiscate everything like the French people did uh, in, in their uh, PR office, it, it, it costs them nothing. So a, a domestic agreement on all the local stakeholders, academicians, uh, industry members, it, it means nothing. E even though we uh, get all the right people, it, it won't make a difference. And we, we saw that happening on other Asian countries. and. To, to add insult to injury, uh, there is no ministry who want to propose Uber as a topic on V-Taiwan. The Ministry of Transport, uh, who has been fining uh, Uber for more than a million euros now, a lot of money, um, they, they don't want to propose this because to, in their eyes, they're criminals. To, to deliberate with criminals is nonsense. Right. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Uber lawyers say the transport ministry has nothing to do with us. We're a e-commerce company. It's the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So the MOEA should propose the task. But MOEA says this is not really our job and we don't want the flag that comes from the transportation uh, ministry. And then the Jacqueline Tsai actually thinks this task belong to the Ministry of Finance because she t cares about insurance and taxation. These two things are about the Ministry of Finance. Uh, but the Ministry of Finance has never worked with anything like sharing economy before. So they, they don't even want to uh, propose this initial slide that shows the, the problem definition. The MOEA and MOTC has the problem definition, but they don't have the, the, the w willingness, so to speak. So it's 
before v Taiwan, uh, it's been like a year. And then whatever happened in France happened in Taiwan too, in a smaller uh, degree. I mean, the, the taxi driver did surround the Ministry of Transport <laughs> and they, they, there were some kind of Occupy going on. There were some kind of strike going on, but but in a lower scale. So, so people generally think we have to talk about this, but none of the ministry want to go to the V-Taiwan to propose this. And the V-Taiwan uh, deliberators uh, talk about our process and concluded that the, the domestic um, consensus making doesn't even make a dent to Uber. So these are just facts. So um, what our strategy is at this point then is to introduce uh, professional mediators that could uh, link together the stakeholders, not just um, domestically and not just uh, on the private and civil sector, but literally all the drivers in Taiwan. We, we want to engage all the drivers in Taiwan to the V-Taiwan process. And this is a very different kind of populace, the other domestic issues I talk about. now. Because Uber operates primarily in Taipei, Taoyuan, Taichung city, and we know that all the drivers there basically use the mobile phone. The mobile phone penetration rate is 97, 98. So, so there's less of a representation problem uh, if we require their participation online. But the problem with taxi drivers or other drivers is that they don't really have one minute to look through the slides and then make informed decisions or, or whatever that right? they were driving and making a business a living out of driving. So we have to lower our participation threshold. It was one minute, right? It has to be five seconds or less because otherwise we don't engage these people. Uh, and we, we even had a way of saying it uh, is that uh, it must be um, engaging within a, a red light. Uh, of time, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, of course, we don't actually encourage people vote while driving. Uh, no voting while driving. Uh, so, so when, when they engage in the time process, we encourage them to park first. Uh, but in in any case, we want to engage a very different kind of people. Their passengers, their drivers, they're on the car. They only have the mobile phone, and we need professional mediators to send uh, to the association of all the taxi drivers to send them instant messages or SMS for them to go on the V Taiwan on the same hour, and then for the Uber to all their drivers, and then and so on. So all the stakeholders get the same URL on the same hour of the day, and says go go on here because whatever you say here will become the agenda a month from now for all the stakeholders to talk about. And so this, this actually worked. Uh, what would they see when they use their phone on a stoplight uh, it is uh, just four very simple sentences saying, um, this is button up. Everybody in Taiwan wants to talk about Uber and then Airbnb and then Bitcoin. Uh, and we have one specific question, which is, is it okay for private non-professional licensed people to carry passengers and charge them for it. So this is a very narrow thing. We don't talk about sharing economy, Uber Black, whatever. And then uh, we say, a month from now, we have a national debate. We will invite Uber, Uber will come. But the agenda is decided by you guys. And then the open data is published for independent analysis and we guarantee the liberation. And the interface they see on their phone is this very simple thing. They see one random sentiment, I feel or I think, from their fellow citizens. Like this one says, you know, um, passenger insurance is very important. And then they take one second to press I agree or I don't agree. And that's it. That's all we ask of them. And as they press yes or no, agree or disagree, their avatar change uh, in this landscape. This is a open space technology simulation online. So basically people stand in their different positions and as you say yes or no, you move in their positions. If you log in with Facebook, you see your friends' heads. Uh, and initially there are four different groups, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, Uber passengers, other passengers. And then you, your task is to convince people neighboring to you to accept your view. And then the system only shows the views with the highest consensus within a group. So, so this actually worked. Um, if, so this is uh, 
a what we call dimensionality reduction. We have two primary dimensions. So based on the yes or no, we see the two most contentious topics. And then the, the one that's most contentious, we use it as the x-axis, and the second as the y-axis. And that changes as people propose more sentiments for other people to vote with. So it's a very dynamic thing. Um, and we, we say this will go on for a month. And then we promise to publish an independent you know, analysis material. So what happened is that on that hour, when the four broadly speaking groups formed of equal people, uh, it, this is very important because we, if we don't get the URL to them on the same hour, you will go online and see everybody is Uber driver and, and that will turn everybody down. So, so it's very important that everybody gets on at the same time. And then uh, the consensus at the time of the two groups the first says we don't negotiate with criminals, basically. And then the second says, even if there's a lot of texting on the street, I will still call Uber. And so they're very two radical um, groups, and that's our first uh, primary factor. But if you multiply the numbers, these are both uh, minorities. None of this has majority across all populace. These are actually minority opinions. They were just majority within their small group. And so, because the system rewards only arguments that gain support from your group, people were forced to invent more moderate ideas to gain consensus from people who think like them. So, after a week, um, the group one now becomes, okay, this is not about Uber, this is about you know, the Minister of Transport has a duty to, to, you know, tax a fine on any unlicensed driver. The fact that they did not do this to other people and just for Uber is maybe a problem, but <laughs> it is their duty uh, nevertheless. And that, that's more moderate, it gave more uh, support. And then the, the next, the group two evolved into all the Taiwan taxi in the large cities have to join one fleet or another. And this is, uh, you know, a corporatism uh, thing that limits the choice of taxis. And Uber provides an opportunity for a driver to join multiple fleets. This is a innovation. Uh, and just by saying this, they gained 2% of populace. Some taxi driver jumped to this group just by reading this uh, sentiment. So, so after a week or so, the four groups start to form into two, uh, broadly speaking, pro and anti-Uber groups. And another week has passed before we have a uh, what we call a majority consensus, which is something that everybody, regardless of the four or two groups they're in, agrees on. So it starts with some very general reflections because we ask for people's feelings, like the laws should change with time. So most people who saw that agree with that. Uh, and or for example, uh, although there's many important topics, the security of passengers is the most important one. Everybody agrees with that. And then after another week, uh, people start to propose concrete solutions or ideas to garner uh, like uh, cross-group support. And this one from uh, Ivan in Mozilla Taiwan, a, a Firefox developer, uh, says we should introduce the same five-star rating system to all the taxis. Because the, the thing that in, ensures Uber's quality is its rating system, it's not anything else. So if the government mandates all the independent taxis and fleets introduce the same system, we can get the same quality. And then Uber you know, becomes a non-problem. Uh, so, so that actually, everybody agrees, even Uber themselves. <laughs> And then the initial, we don't argue with criminals, uh, which initially had 70% agreement that says we, we don't argue with criminals, uh, eventually got less and less, less support. So by the third week, most people over 65% um, think, okay, they're criminals, but we still sit down and talk with them. And by the end of the, the polling period, most people think, okay, let's talk with them anyway. So by the fourth week, and this is why we need four weeks, because experience tells us on the fourth week, people finally agree on something that's actionable. 
Before that, it's just random reflections or general observations. But after trying to convince each other so hard, because the system only shows the things with the higher score, right? <clears throat>、um, people start to to come up with very nice ideas, actually policy ideas, like it should be fair to both Uber and non-Uber drivers. Like the taxation is very important. Like Uber must register and the registration must display prominently on their window or in in their cars. And then、um, this is not just a commerce because like. Medicine and food. This is a matter of public safety, and that if people want to avoid tax, if people really are ride sharing, then Uber should ensure that people who go to work and go back to work, they should only ride, you know, those two times, and it's okay to evade tax like that. But if you you take more than two routes of people, then of course you're actually making a living out of it, and and you're a, a business person. So、um, so that's one policy suggestion. And the taxi drivers should be、uh, allowed to join multiple platforms, even existing taxi drivers. So these are the suggestions that has over 80% consensus, which is our cutoff point, and that became the agenda of our deliberation.、Uh, and before we did a deliberation, we, we did a comparative analysis using this data and and show、uh, what other countries are doing based on these six demands. And so, so yeah, that was that was it. So we, we showed all those consensus. We ask each stakeholder whether you want to compromise or not. And so it's like a progress bar. It's actually written like a progress bar on, on the blackboard, on the whiteboard.、Uh, Uber says,、uh, eventually, yes, we will provide insurance terms、uh, to to the Taiwan government, which they haven't done to any other non-U.S. country. And um, um, and the taxi fleet. Says that if you open search pricing, then we will introduce a new class of taxis that competes directly with Uber, and then the Ministry of Transport says, "Okay, we will do that." And then the Taxi Association of Independent Drivers says,、um, "You know, the main problem is that Uber takes a 20% cut. If they take just a 2% cut, we will work with them tomorrow."、Uh, so it becomes a matter of negotiation <laughs>、um, on the table. And so, so basically, the the progress bar says. Uber is illegal because of these six things, and on that meeting we extracted promise of maybe three or four things, and so everybody sees that it's illegal still because it doesn't satisfy the other two of the six demands that we demand of them. So there's no no arguing. The the protesting doesn't do anything. If they agree, then it becomes a legal company. If it doesn't, well, it's illegal. So and, and that's how how we get. The three ministries to、um, not afraid of losing their face <laughs> and putting the one thing that they care about into the initial uh, police uh, conversation deliberation to to vote, and then we get the the taxi drivers and the association and the civil society people into this this shared space. And the additional good thing about this is that Airbnb people were watching the live stream all the time, <laughs> the entire process. They were, they were, they were watching it very closely. So they they knew actually bef before us. We we worked with academicians on the methodologies of how to set the police issues, like three questions about what kind of people you are, whether you have a professional driver license, whether you're a taxi driver, whether you've taken Uber before, and、uh, the, about the thing that the, each Ministry want to hear about taxation, insurance, and safety, and then about the things that government could actually do something about. So that was our initial、uh, questions, but it was a heuristic. But Airbnb figured it out very quickly. So、um, when we, they know that we're going to use Wikipedia data to show the timeline. So so they went and edited Wikipedia, and <laughs>、um, or people with sympathy to them. Well, I don't have proof that it's Airbnb employee. And、um, when when we started the post again with, with this this idea, they sent email to all Taiwan Airbnb members saying, "Please show your support of Airbnb on this rulemaking platform." And so, of all the people who have used Airbnb before in Taiwan.、Um, There are three groups who all of them have used Airbnb before. They are members. One group says it has to satisfy some laws. Still, landlord、uh, must、uh, have 
those duties. And the other thing says at least the current quality has to be guaranteed. If it's just your home, then it has to be said so. If it's actually illegal hotel chain, one person has 30 different homes and each of them has the same photo, uh, it has to be outlawed and Airbnb must answer to this. And of course, there's uh, one third of people says, you know, this the internet, the government stays out of it. But, but it's the minority actually, 30% of people. So the the time when Airbnb sent an email to all its Taiwan members uh, is here. <laughs> so before that, we had maybe, I don't know, 3,000 or so. Uh, and then after that, it's like 10 times. And so, But this is unfair because most of Taiwan people are not Airbnb members. It's just they're so good at mobilizing. Right? So, so we said exactly that, saying we respect the people who are Airbnb members, but they shouldn't get more representation than people who are not members just because Airbnb are so good at mobilizing. Because we have uh, statistics showing uh, how many people in Taiwan have used Airbnb. So the other group consensus, people who don't and won't use Airbnb before, are also at least equally important. So these four merge with the, those three become our agenda. And the main uh, contention was that we discovered that most people think Airbnb is a good idea, especially for foreigners visiting Taiwan. But if they are themselves uh, visiting other cities in Taiwan, they will not use Airbnb. In the same day, we can go from being super public to exchanging our service for money to voluntary sector work and so on. So a, a way for different sectors to, to meet somewhere and extract promises out of each other, I think it's generally useful. And so, and it's only, it also provides a ladder to, to turn the so-called collectivists at the beginning of my talk, people who just spend time to click like or unlike on the internet, something else to do. If they have, you know, 10 seconds more time, they can share our their liberation link. If they have more time, they can engage in questioning, which gets guaranteed answer. And then if they have more time in a laptop computer, they could do meaningful discussion. And then if they have even more time, they can do a uh, deliberation. If they have some time to attend a deliberation for two hours, well, they can participate in the agenda setting. So that's my talk. Thank you very much.